Hey, everybody. Welcome to We've Got Worm, a Daily Planet Films podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss the hit web serial Worm week by week, arc by arc. I am your host and dangerously desperate and overconfident thinker cape, Matt Freeman, and this is my co-host and remote-controlled and bringer I call Mecca Scott Daly. Yes, I shall follow you anywhere you go and dispense justice until I run out of things to dispense justice on. Then I'll probably kill you. This was a really great plan of yours, Matt, and surely won't have any negative consequences and, and probably won't drive you completely insane right up until the moment of your death. But but for now, this is the podcast where you, a worm expert, guide me, a first-time reader through Wild Bo's world of superheroes, supervillains, and everything in between as I inspect, interpret, and even speculate on what the story is and where it is going. This week, we are covering Arc 28, Cockroaches. And if you couldn't tell by that intro, this is the one where our, our heroes... Uh, bring the Endbringers to the fold and recruit them as allies. Uh, this was a very, very interesting one for me, Matt. And I, like, it's it's weird because there's so many great moments in this arc that I think it's going to, like, we're going to be our usual positive, excited selves about many of these parts. But I think overall, this was one of the weaker arcs for me. Um, there are parts of it, like, the the the... the arc of the arc um didn't grip me as much as they had been in the past yeah so so just speaking generally this arc was a lot harder for me to do my summary for um and i think a lot of that has to do with the fact that a lot of really cool things are happening but it's it's in the manner of, of like a braid where there are many many parallel tracks of many different side characters having little beats of characterization and it is at a really rapid tempo, actually. Uh, but that's actually really hard to summarize because it ends up um, in, instead of a synopsis, you you get like a series of one sentence paragraphs that are <laughs> like, and then we get a beat from Imp, and then we get a beat from Rachel, and then we get a beat from Shadow Soccer, yeah. and and it's a, uh, it's, it's, I I had to drop a lot of those moments because otherwise it would be that this would have been an incredibly long episode that would also not have a whole lot of flow to it because it would have just been like now let's talk about this and and that i i think the reason i the reason i mentioned the difficulty of summarizing it is is that i think that's maybe why it it feels different in a pacing sense i don't know do you feel like there's any validity there yeah absolutely i I talked about this like in in my live tweet that I, i felt the pacing seemed a little wonky and then in my my read through my second read through really examining it i kind of cracked why and i think it's exactly the way you you uh you explained it is that we're moving we're doing so many things and this is really like a working arc like this has to do we have to take the huge event that just happened and we have to connect it to the end to the climax of the story the climax of the story is right down the road we can almost see it but we have to get there first and to get there there's this heavy workload that has to be done to get us to that moment to pull us to that moment to pull all our characters to wrap up all the little side things um so yeah we have this it's kind of one long series of vignettes where we're jumping between characters and talking to different characters. And there's not really like a lot of arcs have a natural, um, story structure build to climax and release, um, within that, that arc. And this doesn't really have that. It has several mini builds. We kind of like build tension and then release it like many, many, many times over the course of the arc, but not in one continuous fashion. Um, and I think that's, that's a reflection of the fact that this is a a connecting arc. Um, yeah. And so I I don't, I don't, I don't think it's like a comment on the writing specifically, but just because of all the things the arc has to do, it just wasn't, it didn't pull me in as much. Um, but that's not to say that there's aren't moments in here that like absolutely took my breath away, which there, there are for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is an unusual arc. I'm I'm not sure. I don't think that I dislike it. I, I think it's interesting that you use the term vignettes um, and, and I think what draws that into the starkest um, a- a appearance is the the interlude of this arc is more or less literally a series of vignettes from different characters. And, right. and there's, there's kind of a fun gimmick that, that wraps that up that makes it consistent with the other interludes. Um, but but it's clearly this arc is moving around so much that even in the interlude, it has to 
it has to dance around between points of view to give you all of the um, perhaps all the perspectives on what's going on that it needs to. So, yeah. so like you said, it's it's a it's a functional uh, choice in, in in some ways. Yeah, but we we do. I mean, it, that does happen outside the interludes as well. I mean, we move like we have to we we wrap up this where we go with with saint and we do our stuff with saint and then we move on to this thing and then i mean the first three chapters i think build nicely to this we're going to control end bringers moment but from then from there on we kind of just jump to different things and we have this these moments where taylor is told um you know deal with all your stuff close off all your relationships like wrap all this stuff up because this is it this is the end um so i mean that's why that's why we have these moments where taylor's jumping scene to scene after a few paragraphs because that's literally what she's doing she's closing things down she's visiting characters she hasn't seen in a while and talking to them and and doing those final conversations and that's important those are very important necessary parts of story but um i don't know i, I like i don't i feel like i'm being more negative than i want to be um it's just i i there, like i said there are moments there are individual moments in here that i loved very very much but that that abrupt kind of change in pace between those moments kind of threw me a little bit yeah um it, it's funny this just occurred to me but i was thinking about how the the presence of doormaker's power and their their you know sort of carte blanche access to doormaker's power makes things very different and uh, they they change settings so many times in this arc that eventually i think i just stopped mentioning and i'm just like and then taylor goes <laughs> here and 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 it's funny to me because um I always like a, a nitpick of mine about the Wheel of Time series, which I'm a known connoisseur of, was <laughs> that for for a huge amount of that story, they have access to like unlimited teleportation power, which is pretty much like what Doormaker's power is, and yet they never use it to like go talk to each other and have conversations that they should be having. <laughs> so it's actually very refreshing to me that people are just like, oh, I need to go talk to Bob, uh, door to Bob, and it, they just do that. Yeah. yeah. So, but it is it is very much that like it feels kind of like the end you're at the end of the video game and now you have fast travel so you're just mm -hmm. going around like <laughs> having your last conversations closing off your side quests before it's time it's time for the main fight um and and that's like not that. a, that's yeah. not a bad thing that's not a bad thing at all but it does kind of um interrupt the flow of a story i guess especially when you're used to it working the way it's been working yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But of course, it 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 works within the world because we have established rules, and we're not, we're never breaking our established rules. This is not my frequent Game of Thrones complaint where they're just teleporting around the world willy nilly in that, and it makes no sense, and it's just ignoring time and space because they don't want to have to deal with that anymore. This is in world makes sense, like mm -hmm. established, yeah. following the rules that have been been set. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think I think we're gonna have a lot of a lot of things to say. Um, again, you know, as as negative as I was, I still enjoy just about everything I read here. So, yeah, yeah, me too. I think, yeah, I mean, it, you can't you can't talk about this arc without talking about how it's it's markedly different from the other uh, arcs in terms yeah, of pacing yeah. and, and structure. So, yeah. yeah. All right, uh, let's do some quick announcements. Sure. So, first of all, uh, the fan art contest with the theme of Doctor Yamada saves the world. The artwork is due today. Wednesday, November 22nd by 11.59 p.m. So uh, if you're listening to this on the day that it's released, please go ahead and send that artwork in so we can uh, put that in the running. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, like, since right after that's due is the Thanksgiving holiday, I think we probably will not, like, put the artwork up for a vote until next week. Um, so if you're, if you're listening to this in a week from now <laughs> they'll be up for a vote but it'll probably be next tuesday or wednesday that we actually put the artwork up for a vote just because of the holidays but yeah please go get those in yeah all right now moving on to comments and questions from the reddit there were some really amazing ones um yeah uh, so, absolutely so the first uh megafire 7 on reddit points out that the taylor rachel coke interaction is actually a three beat rachel gave taylor her coat way back in arc five because taylor was cold Taylor then made a coat for Rachel, and now we're full circle again with Rachel giving her coat to her best friend. Yeah, I liked that. Uh, I completely missed the first beat in that. So I think we, we pointed out that this was a completing of a circle, but we missed that first one. So there we go. They're, yeah, they're yeah. everywhere, guys. You start looking for three beats, you see them everywhere. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And I, I, I wonder if that was one of the ones where I 
was like, oh, I should notice this later and then forgot that I don't even <laughs> think I can claim that. So. I think someone did say we forgot to specifically call out the first beat of this oh, in our yeah. summary. So that would make sense why we did not realize it was a three beat because we didn't yeah. call it out the first time. But those <laughs> things, I mean, that's the problem, especially when you're reading for the first time, that these things don't seem like they're intentional beats that need to be called out until until you realize that it's part of something something else. Yeah, that's that's what makes the making the synopsis so hard sometimes is yeah. I'm like I'm like I know that like this I can't afford to call out every single one of these beats but also if I drop them like I I'm I'm dropping something that was very intentional and, and important so <laughs> Right. And and I think yeah. that's like you you are the the hero of this podcast because <laughs> what you have to do with pulling out stuff that's important but not in a way that indicates its importance and knowing how to juggle like because this this writing especially in these later arcs is so dense there's so much going on every line every sentence matters it's doing something it's either setting something up or closing something out or or a combination of both and you gotta you gotta parse that in a way that we don't miss stuff that's big but obviously we can't talk about it all so hats off to you sir well thank you that's very kind of you to say but obviously this wouldn't have happened if you hadn't been game for it so it's a it's a partner effort all right so, yeah <laughs> um so uh myriad on reddit goes on to give some great insights regarding the use of death in the book um i, I it was a it was a great comment overall yeah. um and and i'm just going to skim kind of s- some highlights where they said Um, most importantly in in a genre where character death is rarely permanent or ultimately consequential, every character death has a real and recognizable impact on both the story going forward and especially on the other characters. Um, each death has a consequence uh, and doesn't just show off the danger of whatever moment the character died in, but leaves a lasting impression on the other characters going forward. And then he, and and then they name some of the, some of the characters, that die and, and and what impact those characters' deaths have on the the people surrounding them, such as the the, the deaths of the various wards, um, the death of Battery, the death of Coil, Alexandria, and Tag, which drive forward the plot as well as Taylor's character, and and uh, Alex's death um, on on Taylor and Aisha, and and of course Aster, and I think there are I think there are others actually that that you could yeah. just you could name practically every death. Even um, someone else in the thread points out the um, the the poor the poor um abb um unwilling gang member who <laughs> bakara kills which which is the moment kind of that shifts the genre of the story a little bit into being a little bit more realistic yeah i think this is first of all just a wonderful comment overall uh, very thought provoking i read it several times um but yeah i mean like especially coming off a week where we had justice league um which uh spoilers someone Someone doesn't stay dead in that movie um, where the death has they, where they, they attempt to give the death per purpose and thematic purpose and narrative purpose. But it doesn't it doesn't matter the, this person's absolutely right in the superhero genre. Death is not rarely permanent and rarely matters outside of a gimmick to sell comic books. And then we move on when we need the character back. We bring the character back. And this is not this is not how this book operates. And yeah. I, I love I love the idea that they have narrative purpose while also thematic purpose and character purpose, and and that's absolutely true. Yeah, totally. Um, so next we have a little bit of uh, follow up info on on our uh, we've got Ward announcement. Um, yeah, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, so I, I just I just wanted to touch on some of the follow up questions and comments and concerns we got. Some people were talking about speculations and how. Um, because I've been fairly good, which I'm, I mean, like I'm 50% about on my correct and and incorrect guesses. So it's not like I'm like a a savant at this or whatever, but, um, that they're worried that us speculating or spending a lot of time on speculations for Ward could possibly ruin the story for people. Um, and I agree. And also in, in my opinion, I don't know how you feel about this, Matt. I don't want the speculations portion of the show to be a large one. I don't want us to spend a lot of time on it. I don't want us to spend time on, on treating the story as if it's kind of a puzzle that needs to be cracked and we need to spend several minutes each week trying to figure out what's happening next and trying to, to crack it. I want to enjoy it. I want to talk about it and I want to chat about it with people 
and then we can analyze the arc after after the fact. But um, I don't I don't want this to be like a lost message board where we're look look at is this a clue? What does this clue mean? What can we interpret from this? And, and yeah. I, that's not what I want. And we've we've seen the same thing happen with Game of Thrones, where you know he he took so long to release the story that people have figured out a lot of the things that he clearly intended to be long-standing mysteries. And and the thing is, any story that's properly designed with foreshadowing and thematic coherence is going to be, in principle, predictable. Um, like yeah. that, it, it, good stories are in principle predictable. I'm not saying bad stories. I'm I'm saying all in order for it to even be a story, it has to, in some sense, like like make sense. So so yeah, if, if we're if we're scrutinizing it and we're yeah, if if we're basically, I don't see how that helps anyone's enjoyment basically no on, on any level so no, so i and, agree with you and yeah. i think it was fun in this project because the majority of the people listening to this already know what's going to happen so seeing me pick it apart and attempt to guess what's going to happen next when you already know that stuff is more fun but doing it when we're all on the same page we're all on the same level that's less fun and it's less what we want to do we want to we want to analyze we want to point out like why the story's good, why it's engaging, why it's you why it's tense in this moment, why it's scary in this moment, how Wildbo does this, how he continues through it, and and really speculating and guessing, always guessing what's gonna happen next. I just I just don't want that to be the focus. So if yeah. you, if you're concerned about us ruining the story as we guess, that's not that's not what we're gonna be doing. Yeah. Uh the other thing uh we mentioned kind of just briefly during our announcement that we were considering you know, live streaming episodes and interacting with the audience on the, those live stream more. Um, we got a couple comments from people saying that that they were worried about that because they know they can't participate and they think that uh, interacting with the audience on live streams really detracts from the conversation. Um, I agree with that to a certain extent, and I don't think I don't think our our weekly episodes where we're not covering the arc as a whole are going to be us just chatting with the audience the entire time. I absolutely do not think that's going to be that. And, um, I, I think we are going to live stream them because that's what we have been doing for the normal recording sessions. And we might have a Q and a part afterwards that we may or may not just cut from the actual released podcast audio part. Um, that's just for the live streaming audience. But if you're, if you're, if you're worried, if the worry is, you're just going to be talking to your audience the whole time. And that's really weird and disjointed for a person listening the next day. I agree with you. And that's not what we're imagining. Yeah, that's, that's not what we had in mind. And, and I, I'm, I assure you it will be a pleasant audio experience. Yes. Yes. Um, the last one is there were a few people that were like, ah, I thought you were going to cover twig or pact. Um, and I think I, we, we, we explained in the announcement why we were doing this, that participating and, and going on a journey with everyone else live during the book is something that, that both you and I wanted to experience. And we wanted to share that with y'all and, and talk through it with y'all and, and be part of the community. Um, that does not mean that we're not going to do anything with Twig and Pact. Um, that does not mean that I'm not going to read them. And if I'm going to read them, I'm probably going to either talk about them in some way or write about them in some way um, just because I crave attention. <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, so I, I am not saying we're not going to do things with that. Um, I'm just saying that it is not going to be in the format of we've got worm. It's going to be something different, but it, I I'm going to get around to them. Eventually I'm going to take a break from reading tons of wild bow every week uh, as soon as we finish this, like we're going to be doing two to three chapters a week, which is much more, more manageable. And I'm going to focus on reading uh, some of the other books in my giant stack of to be read books that has been gathering since we started this project. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to get to these books and 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 we're going to do something with them. So uh, don't don't I, I understand some of you are disappointed. You really wanted to see us cover them. And we will do that in some some format. We just don't know exactly what that's going to be. yet. Yeah, I think it just made the most sense for us to move on to worm two after finishing worm and yeah. it just so happens that worm two is starting up now so also to do worm two like like we did worm one it would mean i would not be able to read anything in this for a long time until we decide to start doing it yeah and i want to i want to read it <laughs> right so yeah probably yeah. years so, yeah. yeah yeah right so yeah yeah all right um and with that let's move on into discussing arc 28 cockroaches we open up with 
a voice saying, man, oh man, did you ever fuck the dog here? And then Taylor thinking, blaming me? Yes, Taylor, it's it's everyone else that blames you. This isn't any kind of projection. Yeah, no, not at all. That's not, I think it's, these are the first words of the arc. Like, you, yeah. exactly. This is this is what the arc opens up on. We leave Eidolon's defeat, Sion's giant revelation to him, and this is the first thing we have. Um, this expression that I've actually never heard of, I don't know if you had heard of it before this. I'd never heard of fuck the dog, but I, I Googled it. It's It's real. I think, I think I think I probably heard "screwed the pooch" way more often, oh, but now I'm it. like, well, that well, this is clearly funnier than "screwed the pooch," it's though. Way funnier. I'm just gonna yeah. say this from now on. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I like. You're absolutely right. The Taylor's whole mindset through at least the early part of this arc is guilt and and blame on herself and this this notion of defeat. And last arc, as we said last week, was all about identity. Taylor trying to discover who she is. Um, and find a place in this world for that person that she she's realizing she is. And in classic worm fashion, the second that Taylor has a handle on who she is or, or she thinks she does, she suffers an, a huge defeat, a big loss. She fails. And this, of course, begs the question that's going to be kind of laid out through this arc. And, and in my opinion, I, I don't know yet, but the, I would assume the rest of the book is now that she's attempted to find herself and she suffered this defeat is it going to push her to something else is it going to push her to do something more um force her to to do something crazy and risky and and devastating and and humanity stripping and i mean we we don't get a great start with <laughs> this arc where the solution is let's just control giant horrible monsters yeah yeah we'll we'll, we'll get to that there's definitely some apparent backsliding i think but anyway, yeah, Taylor wakes up, not dead, overhearing a conversation between Tattletail and Dr. Mother. Tattletail has got the doctor all riled up, apparently, and she's insisting that Cauldron drop the ball in a major way by not evacuating people when they had the chance. Yeah, I, I did enjoy how Rachel did not like the continued uh, dog-fucking metaphor. Yes, that was hilarious <laughs> it to me. It's really great. Rachel has a lot of great moments throughout this entire arc. Um, some of them funny, some of them like damn look at this girl um but it's a great it's a great tone setting moment for her um i love that we see dr mother mad here mm -hmm. we haven't like she's always been just like completely calm completely chill um but she like goes right for lisa's jugular here and like basically calls her stupid mm -hmm. and and lisa fires back basically calling her the the angel of death the Dr. Mengel, is that how you pronounce his name? I think so. Uh, yeah. Um, the, the, of course, Mengel is the, the Nazi. I think he ran out, he ran Auschwitz, right? And he did all kinds of horrible experimentation on people and, and countless deaths were because of him. So she, yeah. like Lisa fires back and like they're just like slinging hatred at each other. They're pissed. And it's cool seeing Dr. Mother in a state where she's kind of losing control a bit, but this is establishing once again, um tattletale and her emotional state and and lisa like lisa is out of everyone that puts up a, an emotional wall puts up a mask lisa's is the best she's the best at keeping it up so much so that taylor forgets or doesn't notice um and we have that again here throughout the the, mm -hmm. the emotional beat throughout this arc is is the mask that lisa's wearing and how long it takes taylor to kind of see through it and see that that her friend is actually like kind of losing it a bit yeah, it, I think it's really excellent to point out here at the beginning that we open up this arc with both the Doctor and Tattletale um, showing that they're both ruffled when these are two, you know, chess master characters who, right. who especially the Doctor, who, who normally we never see ruffled at all. And it, it's clear that things are not going according to plan. Things are, are going very badly, actually. Yep, yep. So Taylor wakes up and she discovers her body to be intact and functional, but feeling a, a bit off overall. In the room with her, she notices a girl with yellow hair with feathers coming out of her, her scalp. It's our old friend Canary. Oh, good. I was, was kind of sad when I didn't see her in that list of everyone that was coming out of the birdcage originally. I was like, oh, the one person that we saw that probably did not deserve to be in there. And she's still in there. So I'm glad. I'm glad she's yeah. out now. Yeah, she survived. She thinks, uh, Taylor thinks to herself, had they rebuilt my legs with the same strength and stamina with the muscles reflecting the regular exercise? If they had, was it really my strength? If they hadn't, could I deal with it? Work my way back to where I'd been? This is just, <laughs> I mean, this is like classic Taylor. 
And she doesn't even give herself a moment of, oh, yay, yeah. I have legs again. Or, or, or I'm not dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's immediately like, oh, are these as strong as my old legs? If they're not, whose strength is that? Is, did I earn this? Yeah. Um, what if I just start all over? What if I need my legs in a critical moment and these aren't quite as strong? And then she goes into like, what about my vagina? Is my vagina different? <laughs> and it's yeah. just like, why can't I just be happy about the fact that I have legs and an arm again? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't know. I've never woken up with regenerated legs, so I'm not sure how I would react to that. Yeah, I mean, you'd probably have those thoughts eventually, but that's like the first first thing she thinks about. Yeah, I know. It's it's funny. So, and while thinking about this, she convinces herself that it was neither Bonesaw nor Panacea who healed her. Uh, for a minute, I was thrown off by her being worried that it was Panacea who worked on her, but then I remembered all those things that happened. Yeah. Yeah. And it turns out that it, it was Panacea, right? Yeah. The, right. Right. Yeah. Um, I think this once again, like shows Taylor, like kind of aware of her compartmentalization. Um, like she's, she's clearly trying very hard to lie to herself here and she, she's not succeeding. Like in the back of her mind, you really get the feeling that she knows exactly who did this to her, but she's refusing to accept it because she doesn't want to deal with that. But she's, there's awareness there. Like normally this is stuff that she does kind of subconsciously, but she's, yeah. she's aware of it. So. Yeah, he's That's, like, I'm going, to, I'm going to intentionally use compartmentalization <laughs> here. Right, right. Yeah. So she chats with Canary a little bit about the state of the world, but she doesn't get many firm answers. She ruminates on how many capes have had their voices or ability to communicate altered by their power or who altered their voices with their power. And basically the train of thought ends at the concept of communication, which is one of our themes. Yeah, and it's a, this is a nice, natural way to get to that theme. Um, and... I think this one smartly builds off of the theme of the last arc, right? Last arc was all about identity and those masks and then uh, voices, the voices we present, the voices we th throw out there and the way we communicate each other is another extension of that mask. And now we're, we're expanding upon it here. And, and this is the first in a setup that like actually glaringly indicates that they're going to be trying to, turn the Endbringers to their side. Of course, it, it, that's only true in retrospect. Like each one of these chapters has a, the first three chapters have a theme to it, which ha revolves around Taylor's realization and each of them connect to, you can see her train of thought as she comes up with this idea. And it's kind of cool how it works that way. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Especially because the reveal of what they're actually planning is held off until pretty much the last second, but yeah. it all makes sense when you, like you said, you trace how she's been thinking, what she's been primed on recently. Yeah. And the, the odd thing to me and the thing that jumped out to me here for a couple of reasons was as Taylor is listing off all those capes who alter their voice, she lists several of them that include herself and also include Eidolon and then Uber as well. And she says, odds were good. I'd fit in Uber's position more than Eidolon. I could guess the Canary was in the low paddock power category as well but i didn't know enough about her and once again we see that taylor's kind of selling herself short here that she's slotting herself on the low power category closer to uber than idolin which uber as we know is the character we always make fun of <laughs> because right. he's part of the goofy team that we never took seriously and of yeah. course like idolin is one of the most powerful capes in the world so that makes sense but taylor taylor's really powerful too but we're again seeing her self doubt here. Um, and it, it reflects on her just general lack of self confidence and, and doubt in herself, but also specifically on this moment, because as we said, she failed and she's blaming herself and Idolin's dead. And she's like, I'm not even close to him. I'm more like this guy who sucks. And it's, it was, it's a reflection of that guilt. Yeah. I think no matter how strong she is, she always feels like she, she needs to be stronger because she needs to be stronger to, to save people basically. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I think we're going to talk about that a little bit more later as well. Yeah. So her friends all arrive and get her up to speed. Um, and and so th this is just interesting here, um, just kind of at a meta level that we're seeing here. And it, I guess it's just highlighted here. It's, it's always true, but it's highlighted here for me to, to a conscious level that Wild Bo is really good at representation because there are five women and zero men in this scene and, and most of the subsequent scenes uh, The the Brian's not around. Alec is dead. Um, so, you know, and, and the other two undersiders who aren't present, Perrin and Foyle are also, um, women. So yeah, it's, it's a uh, very, very noticeable in, in this moment that, uh, that we have a, a very, uh, diverse, uh, 
cast here. Absolutely. And it's all different kinds of women. Um, and it's not, it's not just here, as you said, it's, it's everywhere throughout this book. The, the amount of representation in of both sexual representation, orientation, representation, r- racial representation, this book really does it all. And yeah. I think it's, it's commendable that, and it shows how these things, like, there's no reason why you can't, there's no reason why you can't have, have a team of, of female characters that doesn't just talk about girl stuff you know like yeah. you you can do this and it can be great and awesome and i wish i wish more writers would would treat representation like this yeah me too yeah so they tell her that half the population of earth bet is dead at this point yeah and like we knew things were bad right we come into this knowing how bad things are but we didn't know they were quite this bad and I love how this reveal is structured, too, because Lisa says we lost about half of everyone. And Taylor follows up with everyone being. And Lisa says the capes, civilians, everyone. Half of Bet's one time population is gone, just gone. And you're just like, oh, oh, <laughs> yeah, right. It's it's uh, it, because at a certain like you grasped like, OK, they failed. They failed to stop Jack from from triggering scion so the end of the world thing i guess is going to happen now but you still had some hope like oh well maybe they'll maybe they'll get it together and they'll stop scion like real quick and still save the world it's like nope nope it's already it's already gone world's gone or at least at least taylor's world so it's just a matter of just a matter of picking up the pieces i guess and yeah yeah um and then of course I, i just have to have to bring this out where Aisha says, we're doomed. The dog is fucked, which is like the nth time that someone has said that in the situation. So <laughs> Rachel wrapped her arm around Aisha's neck, seizing her in a headlock, wordless. Aisha struggled and squeaked while Rachel maintained the hold. Not so tight as a choke, but tight enough to be uncomfortable. Um, I just I remember laughing so hard at that the first time. Yeah, and this is uh, the first indication of Aisha being ridiculous, which is going to continue out throughout this entire arc. But also to to be a broken record again i i love rachel i love the character rachel and more than just the character herself i love the growth and journey that rachel has gone on throughout this book and i think hers is the most rewarding uh, character arc for me on a purely emotional level and like old rachel like the rachel we met at the beginning of the story would have like just beaten the shit out of aisha here like Mm -hmm. she would have just like beaten the shit out of her maybe like I had her dogs attack her. This is like a playful, slightly uncomfortable hold that's just like, shut up. Um, yeah. But also, I don't want to actually hurt you. And right. it's just so, it's so wonderful. Yeah, I mean, it's it's probably closest to like the way dogs tussle in a completely um, non-aggressive way, you know? Absolutely. Like, like mama dogs like grab their puppies by the scruff of their neck when they're misbehaving. And yeah. it's like meant to be uncomfortable, but not permanently hurt them and that's like exactly what she's doing here it's so it's so great yeah it's adorable yeah so they finally get around to telling taylor that people are still fighting they're just not fighting scion they're fighting each other and lisa doesn't elaborate she just tells taylor to get dressed and come see on the monitors and and this moment i remember feeling about the same way as taylor feels where where i'm just like like crushed by it but also like of, of course of course they are of course they are you know yeah yeah and like so it's like not only did the cockroaches scatter just like Sophia hinted towards uh, in the last arc but they also decided to eat each other too uh, yeah. to make things worse yeah and this is like as we've seen this is a trigger point for Taylor like this is over and over again throughout the story we've seen her lament the fact that people just refuse to work together and instead of just do their own annoying infighting. They let their petty differences and petty revenges like prevent them from banding together and doing the right thing. And now here at the end of all things, we see people still doing that. And it's no surprise here that like, first of all, the Taylor is just so mad and so upset about it all, but that, that it, that it spurs her on to action and to make some questionable decisions and do maybe some of that backsliding that you hinted at earlier. Um, yeah, that this is, this is something that drives her crazy. Yeah. And and, I mean, I agree because this is one of the moments where you as the reader are like, Oh, come on still, you still can't get it together. But 
but like rationally you're like yeah this is totally what would happen this is oh, absolutely it, it, people would not people work according to their own like local incentives and they're not capable of stepping outside of the system and making the globally right decision which is what taylor always wants them to make and they never do yeah yep. um so as lisa walks away she seems to subtly suggest that taylor work on getting canary to come along and canary insists that she can't do violence and, and she doesn't want any part in it it's easy rachel said taking over while i was distracted you hurt people until they stopped doing whatever it is that irritated you taylor kicked me in the head the first time we met and she was way scrawnier than you are now i stopped doing what she hated me doing setting my dogs on her so now you get to watch Scott as he is torn between finding the philosophy of violence, fixing things, being troubling, but also finding Rachel in this moment to be just absolutely fucking adorable. Uh, I I love this. I love this yeah. so much. I guess yeah. I guess Poe Buddy's nerfed. <laughs> I don't even remember what that's from. What's that from? I don't remember either. I don't remember either. But regardless, it works. It gets Canary to come along with them. Yeah. Yeah, and and I do find it rather interesting that Lisa, who is able to read Canary better than than anyone else, kind of leaves it up to Taylor to convince her. And this is the first beat we see where she kind of pushes Taylor into making the decisive uh, move or uh, being the one who speaks. And it's like she knows that Taylor just has this innate kind of ability to convince people um, to act, to do things, maybe appealing to their own sense of guilt. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I, I think... I think there have been moments where um, where Lisa came on too strong and and tried to do her, her tattletale thing and it backfired on her. And maybe she's just like, I'm going to delegate this to somebody who's not going to go for the jugular with it. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah. So they move into the next room. Tattletale had set up a command center. The bulletin boards, the notes, the files, books and more had all multiplied tenfold. She must have moved me closer to home so I could be watched. So I, I just, I love this picture of th- this picture of Tattletale that this paints. She needs her little sister close to her and she's gone to great effort to have Taylor close to her while she recovers. Yeah, which serves again as a little hint, a little hint towards Lisa's state of mind right now. She's, she's still got that mask up. We can't really see w- what she's going through emotionally, but it's a little hint that like, She's desperate enough that she just needs she just needs to be near Taylor. Yeah, absolutely. So first they watch a video of teachers minions, including a brainwashed trickster, sealing themselves off in a plum world full of supplies. Teacher has distributed a few such devices that allow worlds to be sealed off to other groups. Oh, good. Trickster's back. Yay. (laughs) Yeah, I was excited because... (laughs) You know. No, I mean, like, it's cool that he's back and it's it's kind of fitting for him that instead of having any agency for himself, he just becomes someone else's minion. Yeah, right. I think that's pretty good. Next up, the Yangban have been striking other settlements that have access to portals. Oh, good. They're back. Yay. Yeah, I, I think that was especially frustrating to see like, yeah. oh, oh, the, the, the really powerful, really coherent group that could probably be pretty effective in terms of, of, of their their way of operating they're not helping at all and in fact they're attacking the the other good guys yeah yeah i agree number three cauldron is apparently being attacked by the irregulars and the irregulars are if not winning at least making dr mother nervous yeah and like i'm totally on team fuck cauldron and i'm definitely on team go weld but is this really the time for this shit dude like this is and, and of course we'll touch on this again at the end of the arc but it just seems like I understand you hate these guys and you're mad at them, but what does this accomplish in this moment? Yeah, and yeah, like you said, we'll we'll get to that. Um, so here's another one of those beats of characterization that I just have to pull out, even though um, it it doesn't doesn't quite flow in terms of how I'm summarizing things. Uh, somebody, or I think it's Imp, sort of makes fun of Canary's uh, appearance in terms of her her outfit. And she answers, I dress colorfully so people don't connect me to the Seamurg so easily, Canary said. Keeps me from getting cussed out or beaten by someone who lost a friend or family member. Yeah, this is really good. And I think it's good because when someone does something like that, it usually means that that's happened in the past to them. 
So mm-hmm. it, like most likely that has literally happened to her that someone uh, saw her and were reminded of the Seamurg and beat the shit out of her, which is horrible and tragic. Um, but it also very slyly like reminds us about the existence of the Seamurg. It's like, oh yeah, remember this person? Um, she's going to matter a lot in a little bit. Yeah, that that's absolutely true. I, I just I just enjoy it simply as a matter of reinforcing the depth to this world where you can't point out a character's, you know, civilian clothing style without tripping over a deep character based motivation. Um, yeah, it's, no, you're absolutely really awesome. right. Yeah. 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 Like the, like this, this took thought, like yeah. wild bow, like it's, it's not enough to just introduce characters. I mean, Canary is a side character who at least thus far hasn't mattered too much to the, to the narrative but yeah, even they have a background, even they have something that happened to them, even they have motivations behind every minor little bit of them that, that Wildbo has thought through in detail. And yeah, mm-hmm. it, it just, it, the world feels like a real world. Yeah. yeah. So number four on the list of priorities, the elites, Vegas, Dark, and some of the Thanda are trying to set themselves up as kingpins in the various settlements on other worlds. Yeah, a bunch of bullies, right, Matt? Mm-hmm. I wonder how our newly aware grown-up protagonist will react when given the chance to stop these guys no probably with a proportionate and, and moderate response I'm sure i'm sure number five the sleeper is uh on earth zion number six warlords are on earth bet number seven everything else put together oh so so we're just gonna keep doing this thing where we continue to not tell scott what the sleeper is um that's that's fine it's just mm-hmm. fine until I hear otherwise. I'm just assuming that it's a giant dragon that lives in Velius and, and drops no loot, even if you find a way to exploit your way into killing it. So that's what it is in my yeah. head now. So I mean, yeah, that's deal that with is it. What this, that is what the sleeper is. It is. You've, you've nailed it. <laughs> so the Simurg has showed up, um, but she's just chilling, apparently not attacking anything. So weird. So right after I Dolan died and the Simurg started acting weird. Huh? Mm. Huh? I mm. wonder if that's. I wonder if that's related. Yeah. So so obviously after going through this list of, of nightmarish things, uh the undersiders all break into a fit of giggles. Yeah, uh I I love it so much. It's so human, it's so real. Um like there there are moments in life where you have like something is so terrible and so like relentlessly negative that you can either cry about it or you can just laugh at the absurdity of it all. Like we're all fucked now. We're all fucked and we can cry about it or we can just, we can just laugh at the moment and that's what's happening here. It's, it's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a moment where in the course of, of the conversation, um, Tattletail brings up one of the many beats where, imp is using big words like she says ergo here yeah and this is you're absolutely right that this is a a thing that will continue throughout the the line of this arc with her like increasingly more specific references like she's very clearly like spending time reading classic literature poetry mythology um and it's so interesting why is she doing this where is this coming from why is she acting this way and it's not something that we get um, answered necessarily in this arc, but you can kind of see that she's educating herself. She's transforming herself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we'll, we'll kind of track that as it develops. Tattletail t- tells her that Gru helped heal her and then left and, and he's re- retired now. Actually, Tattletail sent him and Cozen off someplace to hole up. Yeah. So, this is this is the moment where I was literally writing down my response to this part when I completely changed my mind. <laughs> um, okay. So like I was like, oh yeah, I'm really surprised Gru's not not dead. I mean, I guess it, it it makes sense that he's like really screwed up in the head. And as I was typing, I was like, no, you know what? Fuck that. Like I grew the Gru I know would not leave his sister in a in a dangerous situation. He would not walk away from his sister being in danger. Um, and maybe he's changed dramatically over the last two years, but I don't buy it. I don't buy this at all. I think this is very strange. I think it's strange that 
Lisa lays out this perfect, beautiful, um, we sent him off to the farm moment and Tattletail or, and, uh, and Taylor just kind of buys it immediately. Um, this is weird. This is unsettling and I'm, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. All right, Scott. We'll just have to see. Yeah. So that's kind of a, a hint towards a speculation, I guess, but I, I don't, I don't like it. I don't like it. Okay, all right. And I think I think if you look at how people behave throughout this arc, I think it supports what's going on here because I think I think they know what Gru being dead would do to Taylor and what would happen to her and they're they're not going to let her her experience that. And I think she knows it too and she's deliberately not trying to deal with it because she in the back of her mind it's there somewhere. They you don't just go off to the farm and retire in this world. It doesn't happen. All right, I guess we'll just have to pay attention to stuff like that. Okay. So Canary asks if they're giving up. That's kind of the vibe she's getting from all this. And the undersiders make it clear that giving up wasn't on anybody's mind. Yeah, and I, this is such a really great beat here. Um, because, like, the guys are all being, they're being cavalier and they're joking around and they're having fun. And then Canary says, okay, so really that's it? We're just going to, like, get laid and relax and just wait for the end of the world and everyone's kind of shocked at this because they're like this is a new like canary uh, inserting canary into this whole thing is actually very smart because it allows us to see how much these people have bonded like how much of a family they are now and how much is just understood between them without communicating it so we get to see it kind of from an outsider's perspective here with canary and because tattletale's response to what you're really just giving up is kind of shocked she's like what and she gave Canary a funny yeah. look. No, fuck no. Like, of course they're not giving up. They're, they're the undersiders. They don't give up. That's not, that's not what they do. Yeah. This is one of those moments that um, on some level, maybe it's subconsciously or d- definitely for me on, on rereads, I was like, yeah, this is where you you have now mentally gone back to thinking of Taylor as one of the undersiders. She, she, didn't, she didn't really decide to leave the heroes, but now she's with these guys and she's thinking of herself as one of them. And they're thinking yep. of her as one of them. And it's like, it's like nothing ever happened. She's, she's just one of them again. Yep. Poor wards. She's, yeah. I hope they didn't like consider her a friend or something. Cause no. she, cause she gone. Yeah. Um, they like this <laughs> where, uh, um, Aisha says something offensive and, um, Canary said, she looked between Tattletail and me. How am I supposed to respond to that? Just ignore me, Aisha advised, adopting the demeanor of the veteran bestowing wisdom onto the novice. Everyone else does. I guess I'll try. <laughs> oh, poor, poor perpetually ignored Aisha. Yeah, right. It's, it's such an interesting character, and I think that's a lot of what she's doing in this arc. It has something to do with the fact that she's... I, I don't know if I can fully defend this interpretation, but it has some, something to do with the fact that she's tired of being ignored... Yeah, because she's taking a lot. She's taking a lot of attention and wisecracking a lot. And and some of the wisecracking, I think, is meant to remind you of other characters who are no longer in the story. Um, mm-hmm. But I think some of it is explicitly just her trying to exist in people's minds and and not just be on the periphery all the time. Yeah, especially when her brother's dead and she can't actually <laughs> express any emotion about it. Yes, perhaps. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep saying it. Um, okay, yeah. Okay. So as they head out, Taylor asks Tattletail if it really is hopeless. But then when Tattletail seems to be saying that it might be hopeless, she decides she doesn't really want to know yet. Which is like she she builds this as a character changing moment, right? She's like, Skitter and Weaver would need to know, but I'm being Taylor again, and Taylor liked when she was living in ignorance and happy. And it's like I don't know, Taylor. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, I, I, it serves like structurally, it serves as a way to hold off on the Endbringer reveal the truth of the words and the truth of Idolan until the story wants to in the most dramatic way. Like, it's it's a it's a plot device to do that, but it's also like anything else in the story does more than that. It's a reflection of Taylor and her continued search for her identity and like what taylor thinks is taylor is very revealing and interesting yeah it's like i was happy in my ignorance and i was like were you though (laughs) yeah it is interesting that she's 
taking this final pass at establishing her identity. And it's kind of uh, interesting and a little bit convenient what she chooses to include in that identity sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So we move into 28.2 with the Undersiders going to visit Saint in prison. He's being guarded by Defiant and Narwhal. So I know we haven't really talked about this much because she hasn't really been front and center very often in the story so far. But Narwhal, like, cracks me up (laughs) every Mm -hmm. time. Like, just imagining this giant, tall, naked woman with a massive horn coming out of her head just makes me laugh. I mean, she's, like, super powerful and awesome and a great character, but I just can't. I can't get past looking, thinking of the narwhal, the animal, and then transplanting that head onto a naked woman's body. <laughs> yeah. Well, now it's a curving horn, Scott. Yeah, so. it's, it's a crescent moon horn. Yeah. It's awesome. Yes. Tattletail brings up the idea of splitting up to address more issues, more could cover more ground between them, and Taylor just says no because she wants everyone to stay together. Yeah, once again, this is her trying to reclaim and redefine who Taylor and what Taylor is. And, like, Taylor would... Would, would we're going to stick together every time I've split up every time I made the decision to leave these people it was bad so now I'm going to not do that it's yeah like she's gathering a swarm of people Matt. yeah I mean and I think this is a bit more of a, of a defensible sort of decision based on her her character arc because she's basically saying actually I'm tired of putting the mission first at the expense of my relationships with people yes the mission is important but it's kind of pointless to to do that at the expense of people and and also she learned her hard lesson of saying like you know maybe if i'd been in contact with the right people and had the and and had the right relationships i wouldn't have made you know the mistake that she perceives that she made in uh in in failing to to catch jack in time so i think there is a bit of of utility and and thoughtfulness behind this no i I think you're absolutely right um I, i think that the concern here is that the people she's surrounding herself with with are the same people that enabled the kind of behavior she didn't like in herself in the past and we've talked about that we've talked about the undersiders as as enablers for taylor um we've talked about even how the um the removal of, of brian from the team allowed it so there was no one to call everyone and check and be like hey um guys what are we doing here and now now brian is gone so like Yes, this is this is a moment of growth for Taylor. Like she is not putting the mission first, and that's good. But I worry about her just in general. Like it's 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 not like it, it's easy to just say that it's the people she was hanging out with and it's their fault for the road she went down. I don't think that's completely fair, but I I certainly see them enabling her in some sense. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that remains true here. So Narwhal remarks that out of the assembled women, only Tattletail is wearing her mask. Rachel and Taylor are already out in their civilian identities anyway, but uh, Aisha is also unmasked here. Matt, once again, the physical reflects the metaphorical. Um, everyone else here has kind of come to terms with with the mask that they represent and, and the person they're putting forward and not hiding behind this alternate identity. Except for Tattletale, except for mm-hmm. Lisa, who is still putting up this front, who is still putting up this mask, who is still hiding her emotion and how she's really feeling and how she's really doing behind the stuff. And that's literally represented in her still being the only one who's taking the time to wear a costume. Yeah, yeah. And we could maybe infer that the fact that, that Aisha is not wearing a mask has something to do with the fact that she's trying to show herself more. And, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. So Defiant lets on that Dragon has Canary on a list of prisoners prioritized for release. Uh, So that's why Canary was released with the other Birdcage prisoners. And Canary concludes that uh, she owes Dragon for this. Aw, I like this a lot. I think we talked about this back, you know, when Canary's first, you know, sentence and and shipping off to the 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 birdcage how this was kind of indicative of a rot at the core of the cape justice system how they were doing this to make an example of her and how it wasn't fair and time has definitely proved (laughs) that that there was a rot there um but but we're at the point now where a system itself is basically gone but i i I think we're we're reminding ourselves but of the good-natured ability of dragon that that as much as I was untrustworthy of her as much as Saint doesn't trust her that even even the the mistakes in the system Dragon always was aware of and always um trying to work against but literally could not and I love that like 
in the first cha- chapter, Taylor mentions that humanity sucks. Like in a, in a in a moment of frustration, she says we're violent and vile and just fight against each other and destroy each other. And then we have Dragon here, who's not a human, who is who is being nice and she's better than us. Yeah. And fuck yeah. Saint. Fuck Saint. Yeah, I mean, I think that I, I do think this is a fun. You know, we I, I still stand by our impression toward the beginning of the story that we are meant to be suspicious of dragon no absolutely we are meant to see that she's a a a potential potential foe um but but also i I think it's really cool to have a story where you have a really nice ai like i don't know if i've seen that before other than other than other than stories that are about like an android who is really nothing like dragon because she's sort of omniscient but uh yeah, yeah, anyway. yeah. No, I think it's it's really cool, and I still will stand by that opinion. Absolutely, that yes. When we first meet Dragon, we are not supposed to trust her, especially yeah. when we find out she's an AI. Especially when we see a creepy little baby goop dying inside that machine. Yeah, right. And we find out that she's got a special interest in our protagonist. But anyway, um, Saint glanced over the entire room as if assessing us, trying to judge who were his allies and enemies. Uh, in the wake of whatever revelation he had to share. And then um, just, just Lisa drops in and just cock block saying, yeah, reveal okay. blocks, real block. Dragon is a robot, a computer program. That'll tell said, um, which is, which is really funny because <laughs> Saint was clearly going to enjoy that reveal. Yep. But it does make me wonder if tattletale knew this already or, or, or not. She might've, I mean, it's very possible that she literally just connected the dots in that moment. Um, I mean, either way, she kind of makes it seem like she knew for a while, like that this is not something that was surprising to her at all. But that's, again, part of Lisa's mask that that she it's so important that she's seen as the one in the know that even if she just figured something out, she's going to act like it was just known. Yeah, I think you're right. The Telltale recaps what we know about Dragon and Saint recaps his argument that Dragon was becoming too strong to let live. Fuck you. Uh, <laughs> Telltale starts grilling him, trying to find out about Teacher. Taylor puts bugs on him, too, and does her own little bug lie detector thing, uh, which is a trick we haven't seen her do before. Yeah, that's new. Always coming up with, with cool new ways of doing stuff. It may make sense. Like, you can detect, like, increased heart rate, sweat, like, all this stuff. Yeah, right. And she's been around so many other capes who didn't technically have lie detector powers, but who kind of leveraged their power to serve that function. So yeah. it's cool to see her pick that up. Yeah. Um. So basically, when Saint became aware that teacher's power comes with a master element, Saint made it so that his lieutenants would check over his work and look for teacher's influence. Stupid. Stupid. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Those are great beats throughout this. Yeah, I love that. Uh, so just to add to the moral quagmire here, the Dragon Slayers were apparently a nonprofit funneling all their earnings into charities. Oh, fuck. He's still, <laughs> he's still an asshole, Matt. I don't care. He's still an yeah. asshole. I thought it was really funny because because it's it's so easy to hate him, but it's like going out of its way to be like, oh yeah, but he he helped orphans with with the money that he got from yeah, it's just really funny. To me. <laughs> so Saint tells them Teacher's weakness is his son. The Dragon Slayers kidnapped his son and stole a lot of Teacher's equipment, hoping to get one more hit of powers from Teacher. And then Teacher and his team just uh, responded by disappearing into another Earth. Yeah. Uh, so at this point, he's kidnapping a drug dealer's son to get more to get another hit. Um, and <laughs> this is a man called Saint who's riding high on his his sense of morality and a sense of uh, sainthood. Um, and, and like I said, like this is throughout this entire thing, throughout this entire conversation, we have tattletale interrupting every time to call him an idiot to call him stupid over and over again because it's so obvious that he got played here yeah yeah i mean it's it's interesting because a lot of the reveals about teacher's power have been held back from us um i'm not sure if i'm not sure to what degree we understand like the fact that he has this this master element to his power but we uh, we certainly didn't understand much of it until recently um right so so yeah so it, it it's one of the things where if you if that's part of your picture then yeah saint appears to be uh, manipulated definitely so yeah like you said tattletale tells him that he's an addict and then concludes the teacher d- uh, didn't really leave at all 
She thinks that he's going after Dragon's architecture. Defiant goes to check on her hardware, and Tattletale continues the offensive on Saint, telling him that he was a pawn all along, manipulated to push Dragon to make her stronger, paving the way for Teacher to swoop in and take over. Yeah, and we see in the future that this is basically 100% correct. And I think this is really interesting because it's been stated that the the was Saint right discussion was one of the like most hotly contested morality debates of the entire book like there are people very strongly on each side and of course with the information that you knew at the time it's constructed that way but it's interesting that like out of all the gray questionable moral decisions throughout this book this is kind of the one that the book almost 100 percent definitively answers <laughs> Like, yeah, by, by by constructing it this way and by proving that that Tattletail was right and teacher was just manipulating him. We, we basically say Saint was wrong. Saint was ac- absolutely an addict and his lust for power, which we saw a hint of in his 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 interlude, led him to get manipulated, led him to get outplayed. And his decision was wrong here. And now it's kind of fucked everyone. Yeah, it's an, it's it's a it's a kind of need to be important i think that's easy to empathize with but yeah it's it's definitely portrayed sure, as being sure. the wrong choice here yeah the, i the, the connection we draw back to taylor here though is pretty perfect because you and i have specifically used addiction and addict terminology to, to describe some of taylor's decisions and taylor's actions on more than one occasion and and then we have this quote which i think is wonderful which is is title tail snapping back at at saint saying this isn't a drug but it might as well be one all the justifications and excuses that sound perfectly reasonable at the time the compromises you make in the face of something really ugly manipulating the people closest to you the increasing tolerance and it's absolutely true that's that's exactly what what was happening with saint but if i took this quote and removed it from its context and just told you this was someone confronting taylor you would probably completely believe me here yeah yeah yeah, I, I think you're right, and and it's it. I think it may be saying something fairly broadly true about parahuman psychology, even though he's not a parahuman. But it does make you think about how teachers' power works too. Yeah, because it's sort of a it's a very unique um, power where he's he he's able to give thinker powers to other people. So it's almost like they say Saint doesn't have a power, but it's like well, he has a power through teacher he's not mm-hmm. a he's not a parahuman himself but that doesn't mean he doesn't have a power yeah you're right yeah yeah so yeah defiant returns and tells them that dragon's earth side and infrastructure is gone god damn it saint <laughs> you suck you suck so much yeah uh at this point um imp tries to quote unquote inject some levity into the proceedings uh at a highly inappropriate moment by asking defiant about robot poontang <laughs> so not only is this hilarious because she sets it up perfectly she has amazing comedic timing where she like (laughs) takes the time to set it up is like i got a serious question for you you got to answer this one um but it also supports my brian is dead theory because we see imp behaving interestingly and i think as you hinted at last chapter this is kind of um a a callback to how regent behaves how regent attempts to eject inappropriate levity into situations when they feel uncomfortable and we also have said through Brian that when Regent was upset or angry, it was a little more barbed, a little more occurring, a little sharper. Um, and and here it is like this, we're seeing that kind of reflected here that that she's she's going a little further than she's been before, a little more inappropriate than it is before, almost as if something's really, really bugging her, Matt. Yeah. Yeah, because it is it is funny to us, but also you totally understand Taylor being like, "Imp, shut up!" Like, like, like yeah. this is this is such an unfunny, inappropriate thing to say at this moment. We're talking about this di- this guy's person he loves being kidnapped and tortured, basically. <laughs> yep. Um. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I that's, I agree. So Rachel asks, "Why bother going after teacher?" And she has a point. This looks suspiciously like humanity fighting against itself instead of Scion, which is what they're trying to avoid. Why not just let Teacher and Dragon? Uh, why not let just let Teacher have Dragon if he's going to use her to fight Scion anyway? And they all kind of seem to agree that this has to be the way for now, at least. Yeah, but it's Rachel <laughs> that comes up with this. Yeah. Like, not only does she have a pretty good point here, but like, how often do we see Rachel inject herself in a conversation? audibly like how often do we see her communicate with 
words in the middle of a conversation amongst a lot of people. She's just, that's not where she's comfortable. She has such trouble understanding people and participating in conversation with people that she usually does not inject herself like this, but she's doing it. She's taking control of the situation. She's offering her insight. Yeah. Right. And there's she, uh, this, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go this ahead. moment where uh, after Taylor realizes how, how insightful that was, she said she understands more than she lets on. She doesn't always get the simple stuff, but she understands things. She's not dumb. I thought she just thinks differently. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting to think about because we, we know that she's, you know, just, you know, has essentially normal in, in intelligence. She's just limited by social things. And right. it's probably really hard to kind of break into a conversation mid flow if you lack that social circuitry. So a lot of it is probably just her being able to follow the words as they're being said and being able to follow the concepts, but not really having a model of how to even say what she's thinking in a, in a group setting. Yeah, I agree. And let's make sure to remember this whole, um, if they're not actively trying to help end the world, maybe we should just let them be type of opinion when our heroes in a few chapters mercilessly sick an Embringer after some people. Let's just remember, remember that whole mindset. Yeah. I think, uh, capes have short memories. <laughs> so Saint offers the heroes, the dragon slayer suits, if he can go free and, uh, defiant doesn't like this and basically says, I'm just going to pretend that we can say no to this offer, even though we need to say yes, because yeah. I want to, I don't want to let him out, but it seems like he's going to go along with it in, in a bit. So they look over the current threats through defiant systems. Uh, it turns out Bohu has now shown up in a grassy field and he's just chilling. And the chapter ends with Taylor suggesting that there might be something going on with the inbringers current behavior. Yeah. And as we, um, as we talked about at the beginning of the podcast with the, with the weird pacing of this arc, um, how it kind of varied and went all over the place in, in like fits of start and stop and stuff like that. Um, I think on reflection, I, I saw what we've already hinted at as well, that each of these first three chapters sets up something, gives Taylor another piece of a puzzle in which she leads her to the plan that she comes up with here. In that first chapter, we got communication. In the second chapter, we got, um, through Dinah's prediction, this, this idea that there are going to be five armies at the end of the world and there, there are five end bringers. And so now we've got these two pieces of the puzzle coming together, communication, five armies, end bringers, behavior means something. And we're going to get another one in this next chapter. And it's cool that it's like, it's all there in front of your eyes. Uh, it's just like almost impossible to pick up on until you're coming through for the second time. Yeah. That's one of the things where not to get overly meta here, but, but we, we've talked about foreshadowing, I think on some of our other podcasts. And, and the idea is that the idea with foreshadowing is really just to subconsciously prime you on certain things so that when they happen, you're not just where the hell did that come from? Um, and, and that's absolutely what, what wild is doing here. He's, he's setting your expectations subconsciously so that you are you are prepared and you understand what's going on when you get to the point that you need to get to yeah yeah so we move on to 28.3 and dinah um had you know we we, we mentioned taylor's thinking about what dinah had said about those those five five groups of capes um and at first um she thinks maybe they're talking about the idea that these forces are being um comprised partly of inbringers and they agree to consider a preemptive attack um, against against the Endbringers. Yeah, yeah, five five groups, five armies, five Endbringers. But uh, the idea that a preemptive attack would be just like Skitter and Weaver have always done it, right? Just go right right for the violence, the physical approach, and then that's when that that communication word from the first chapter comes in. Um, and again, we're get, we're being laid these these breadcrumbs are being thrown to us, and they're almost yeah. impossible to detect, but they're there. Yeah. We have this beat where Canary balks at wearing a skin tight suit and Saint <laughs> Saint offers her a Dragon Slayer suit and Defiant uh, tells her to accept it, which is a good, cool moment for him. Yeah, we haven't talked about that much, but like he's been handling this stuff pretty well. You know, uh, like Saint is the guy that killed the love of his life, that, that took her away. And we know that he hates him. We know that he wants to kill him. And we know, like he said, he has a one track mind and his, his entire goal is to be killing this person. He said it last arc, but even in this moment, he realizes that the greater need of the world outweighs his selfish revenge, his selfish, his personal want. 
And that's a huge change for the guy who was willing to put capes in the line of fire just so he could be the one to beat Leviathan in, in yeah. Dark Eight. We haven't really peeked into his head in a long time, but it is interesting to imagine him having a similar kind of arms master slash Colin slash defiant trichotomy where he's <laughs> he's struggling with himself over over this identity and, and trying to incorporate these lessons that Dragon has been trying to teach him and become a better person and, and continue to do that even when Dragon's not there to be his his personality spotter. Yeah, because um, he and, made a promise to her, Matt. Remember yeah. that? He made a promise. I know. It's beautiful, it's, beautiful. I know. I love him. So they take a doorway to the dragonfly on Gimmel to retrieve uh, Taylor's costume. She sees the people working to rebuild the settlement, cutting down trees and working hard together. And she feels a warm affection mingled with pity. She can imagine her people down there too easily, working hard even while the world ends around them. She and Lisa agree that humanity isn't all bad in the end. I want to save them, I said, surprising myself with the emotion in my voice. Scary thing is, Tattletail said, I know what you mean. Most times I'm not that fond of people, seeing enough ugliness in them that I don't care. No, that's wrong. I care. I cared, past tense. But I didn't mind if something happened to them. That's closer to the mark. I nodded. I wasn't surprised at that. But we're getting to this point where I want to do something for them like I wanted to do something for you. Probably a bad omen. No, I said, quiet, as I strapped on armor. I looked at her. Do you regret reaching out to me? No, she said, but that doesn't mean it was right. Know what I mean? <sighs> uh, there's there's so much to talk about here. Yeah. Um, the, the first thing I want to breach is that, that Taylor comes to this important realization that humanity is not all bad. And we saw her echo clock blockers, rest in peace, um, people all suck mentality from from in the first chapter she she kind of sounded very much like him in her frustration about the infighting of the the, the scattering of the cockroaches um but now when confronted with the reality of humanity the, the people who just work day in and day out to help each other to simply survive she says oh, people people aren't all bad and i think this is such an important idea an, an important thing because Saving the world is so abstract. The world is big. It's huge. There are millions of people. There are billions. And it's very easy to just break it down to simple numbers. And we've seen Cauldron do that. You know, 10,000 dead, 50,000 saved. Success. Move on. But it's not just numbers. It's, it's not just, you're not just saving lives. You're saving the living. You're saving the day to day humanity the the to the right to, to to toil and work and struggle and help to to love and to carry on even as the world around you is dying and that's that's a fundamentally human thing and it's not abstract it's not saving the world it's saving people it's concrete and it's really what is worth fighting for and and you you get that they kind of realize that in this moment yeah i think this is a big a big part of taylor's arc actually is that at various times, she's had more or less contact with the reality of the people who she's fighting for. Um, you know, for, for a while, she was fighting for, for Dinah, even though a lot of that, it was just kind of the idea of Dinah. And then she was fighting for the people in her territory. And she did a lot of her most overtly heroic things, um, trying to defend the people in her territory who she had a concrete connection with. And she saw what their lives were like. And she she was taking care of them. And then Ironically, as she was actually working as a hero, I think she had relatively less connection with the people because she was she was so mission focused. Um, so I think this is an important moment where she's being regrounded in this idea of, oh, this is what humanity is or, or perhaps can be um, just just human beings trying to get by and and the, the, the good the good that's worth fighting for, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, we have to talk about the do you regret reaching out to me? Mm -hmm. No, but that doesn't mean it was all right. And that's, yeah. that's the, the fundamental thesis of this entire story, right? That like, there are things that you do that are wrong, but maybe, maybe they're the necessary thing to do. Yeah. And like, right. I mean, who, who can say really like, like <laughs> it's, it's this moment, like, 
if we look at Taylor as the as the instigator of a long chain of cause and effect, then then Lisa owes some responsibility to that too by reaching out to her, by pulling her into this and in her in this need to keep her safe and to protect her. Um, and like sometimes you have to do these bad things, these wrong things, and and that's that's the real tragedy of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think. I have a hard time holding it too much against Lisa because as, as Lisa told us a while back, she kind of saw that Taylor was on a really bad path and was probably going to end up dead if somebody didn't do something. And in, you know, from where she was standing, that was pretty much all she could do, at least in her mind. So I don't really hold it against her, but, uh, but I I see why she feels bad about it too, because it led to some bad things happening. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Great, great character moment, and n- not the only great Lisa Taylor character moment in this arc either. Nope. So they take the next door to where Panacea is. She is moving through a hospital, diagnosing people with a touch. She tag teams patients with Marquis, giving him the ones with broken bones, and it's really cool to see her in this mode to see her development. Yeah, it really is, and it, and it feels kind of weird to say that <laughs> prison did Amy well. Uh, but here we are. And, and of course, I don't think it's it's prison itself specifically. It's the idea of taking responsibility for one's actions and dealing with the things that you did and choosing to act in a way that makes up for it. And Amy has done that. Uh, she 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 was always the person who was guilty because she felt like she had this burden. Helping people was a burden that she didn't want. She didn't want to do this, but it felt like she had to. And here she is and she's doing it and she's directing it and, and, and overseeing the healing of people. She stepped into this role and, you know, we, we don't see inside her head, so we don't know how much she considers this a burden, but it seems like she's in her element. Yeah, we see these tiny moments where she's like she's um, sort of looking at or, or touching her tattoos and it's almost like she's drawing strength from right. these ideas that she's made indelible in her body. Um, and we don't know we don't know exactly what they mean. We can probably guess at what some of them mean. Um, but but she's she's found some source of strength that she didn't have before. Yeah. And she knows, she knows who she, she has found her identity. She knows who she is and she knows what she wants and she knows what she's going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at this point, uh, Taylor dis- description fucks Amy's dad. <laughs> That's weird, right? I, I love how she, she goes on for two paragraphs about how, what he looks like. And then she finishes up with, I wasn't even the type that would normally go for that type of thing, even though I just spent two paragraphs thinking about how sexy he is. Yeah. Yeah, sure, yeah, Taylor. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's pretty funny it to has, me because... It has and, 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 probably been a while for her. You know? Yeah. I, I, don't think I, I don't think I noticed this tendency of Taylor's to, to uh, do this to people um, <laughs> and, until, until you pointed it out. But I'm so glad. I <laughs> couldn't resist pointing out that she does this to... Um, Amelia's father here. <laughs> so Panacea notices the undersiders come in and Lisa suddenly tells Taylor to, to take point here, which is probably pretty wise. Yeah. Considering how much Amy, even, even I have found my identity and know who I am now. Amy still really hates this, <laughs> this girl. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Taylor thanks her for the healing. Amelia tells her that it was a quid pro quo for Taylor trying to help her out in a bad time. Taylor asks for help, and she says that she will help, but not at the front lines. Yeah, and now we have to think back. You know, we know what Amy is capable of. We know how offensive her powers can be if she uses them in an offensive way. And we and we know that she had these rules that these you can't cross this line, you can't do this, or else you will be destroyed. And we know that she's crossed the line. She's done it. She's killed people with her powers. She's done thing with her powers. She's done terrible things. But she, it seems like she's pulled herself back, right? Like uh, she knows who she is and she is not the frontline person. She's going to be here healing people. She's going to use her powers defensively and for healing, not not in the offensive way. Yeah. And, and it always seemed like those those bright lines were, were kind of in her head where, where she would say like, oh, I can't work on brains. If I work on brains, then it'll cross this line and then I won't be able to control it. And that's that that was sort of true in a kind of transient way, but also it was only true because she thought it was true in, in another sense. And and like you said, she's been able to to master herself, I think. Yeah, no, I completely agree. 
Um, yeah, you wanted to point out this moment from, from Aisha. Yeah. Um, she says gang is such an outmoded word. So small. There's gotta be a better way to put it. Ruling the roost with the old warlords again back atop Mount Olympus once more. So first of all, she's using the word outmoded, which is not a word that Aisha would ever have said. And now she's referencing Greek mythology. Um, so here's once again, she's reading books. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty fun. It's pretty, I mean, and it's cool that we, I don't know. I, I just love how this is treated by the story where we don't actually know where this is coming from. It's just like, Oh, there's, there's a, a, a side character, a secondary character is, is changing and it's being shown to us, but it's not being, it's not center stage. It's slightly off, off to the left, you know, and that, that, yeah. that yet another touch that makes everything feel that much more fleshed out and all the characters feel that much more real in your mind. And the smart thing that the story does is have, uh, Lisa be the one pointing out how odd this behavior is because mm-hmm. if it was just Taylor, Taylor hasn't been around for two years, but by, by framing it that Lisa is the one kind of shocked and confused by this behavior, we get to know that this is something relatively new, that this is not behavior that she's, she's shown in the past couple of years. Yeah, de- definitely. And also the fact that Lisa is not able to just be like, Oh, you got that from this source because it's Lisa. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Lung and Bonesaw show up. Lung growls when he sees them. And uh, we see Riley is not having a good day. She's She's been relieved of all of her augmentations, and she's being worked ragged. Oh, don't you just feel bad for the poor psychopathic monster? Yeah. I like how kind of seamlessly we translate from, from chirpy Bonesaw to extremely irritable yeah. riley and yeah. and it's it's it, but like it's it's always the same character you're just like yeah i, I always knew this was under the surface somewhere yeah it's, well it's and, the, and it, it wild bow leans on the having her cuss again because we've, yeah. we've spent so much time establishing the difference between riley and bonesaw is that bonesaw hates cussing and won't do it because she's the little girl so by yeah. having by having her cuss like like don't fucking push me we yeah. once again show that oh this is riley this is yeah. This is a different person. Yeah, yeah, good, good point. Yeah, and uh, Panacea reminds them that part of the reason why she can't leave and come to the front lines is that she has to keep an eye on Riley. That's uh, uh, that's a pretty good, pretty good reason. Yep. Lung is very interested in the proposition of fighting and not hanging around a hospital. He's also probably eager to settle the score with the woman who rotted away his junkular area, <laughs> and he, and he took over the city when he couldn't junkular <laughs> lung stared at me and i held his gaze for someone as brutal and vicious as he was in the heat of battle lung had cold eyes well maybe that's because you ripped them out of their sockets taylor <laughs> sorry well just a little yeah just stop being obsessed with lung's eyes it's uncomfortable yeah yeah it isn't i mean I, I do wonder how much of this is projection because she she consistently thinks of him as having this grudge against her specifically but i'm not sure I'm not sure if his behavior bears that out or, or not. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, I, we know from his um, his interlude that he does, but yeah. m- maybe in the in the things that have happened since then, he's kind of moved past it. Because yeah, he's definitely not just like immediately attacking her. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So humorously, Tattletail tries to bait him with the prospect of fighting the young Bon, uh, but. She doesn't actually know that Lung was their prisoner. Right. It's just like a, a lucky guess. Um, and this is like, again, this is a really funny thing where, where, where Tattletail stumbles onto the exact correct thing to do. And it reads as comical and it's fun. But it also shows us something else. It shows just how much she's grasping at straws, that she's reckless and kind of desperate. We're getting these little hints once again that that her headspace isn't as good as she is is uh, portraying to everyone, that she's still got that mask on. Yep. So Panacea and Taylor step through the portal to where Shadowstalker is and they have a private conversation. Uh, that, that is to say, Taylor and Panacea have a private conversation. Panacea warns her to keep an eye on Lung and they talk about second chances and how sometimes it's only the people who need second chances who seem capable of offering them. That's such a wonderful little beat. It's such a wonderful little idea. And it, of course, defines Taylor herself, who is in the middle of giving people second chances and it is wanting them in return. And it's like this, this reciprocal type of behavior that 
I just I love that idea. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, but but this is this is the third beat in our continuing obvious and retrospect setup for controlling Endbringers because uh, she also says, you know, that that Lung is purely an offensive offensive force, and maybe the only way to use him is to point the offensive destruction force into the in the right direction. So that's our last little hint towards what we're going to be doing with the Endbreaker. So we have communication, we have something specific to the Endbreaker's behavior, and then using things built only to destroy to your advantage. And it's like, it's all here. It's all here. It's just right here. You just maybe don't, don't notice it the first time through. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're exactly right. I, I, I love, I love that. I love how that's all put together. I also see this, this whole second chances discussion as an extension of, of prior themes of, of, of guilt and, and how you can't really, get rid of of the guilt of things that you've done that were that were that were you know terrible and hurtful but all you can really do is hope that you can have a second chance and do better next time yeah yeah and it takes someone that's going through that exact same thing to help you realize that you are going through it as well yeah. like like you you have to be capable of extending that that second chance to someone because you know that you personally need it and and really only a person who needs it themselves would be fully aware of that yeah yeah I, lo- I love it yeah so they end the meeting with panacea giving her some relay bugs capable of breeding this time yeah yeah i like how we're near the end of the book now we our, our, our villain our main threat is something of massive power so we can we can go ahead and ramp up taylor's power level here without any real real risk to totally breaking everything because like in theory in theory if she had enough of these things she could just like have the entire planet as her range right mm-hmm. yeah so but um we can do this now because if we'd done this back back in that chapter taylor would have just beaten everything right yeah yeah exactly it has, it has to scale up to the point where it's not game breaking right so she has a, a conversation with shadow soccer they're trying to get her on board you, you can go home, I said. Find your family, settle down, put the crossbow away for good. Capes don't retire, Shadow Soccer said. Doesn't work. We die in battle or we lose our minds, one or the other. I thought of my passenger, how it had reflexively sought out violence in the past, how others had done the same, die in battle. Oh, really? Capes don't retire, huh? What about Brian? He reti- Oh, wait. He's fucking dead. <sighs> Well, anyway, uh, ultimately, <laughs> Sophia comes because she wants to see some action and wants to see what Taylor has, quote unquote, made of herself. Yeah, seems like a good enough reason. Yeah. We skip forward a bit and it's clear from Sophia's freak out that Taylor has some kind of terrifying plan underway. Sophia tries to literally stab her <laughs> and Lung intervenes and then Rachel pins her to a wall with a laptop cable. Yeah. And of course, in media res is a very useful narrative structural device that not only serves to get us literally in the middle of things because that's a that's what it means but to define stakes for us in a way that allows the reveal of information to trickle out in a controlled way and in the most dramatic fashion i think we've talked about this specifically in the past because wildbow has used the in media res device successfully before but uh he uses it again here and it's really great like sophia is losing her fucking mind and we have no idea why but we know that it's enough that she's just like lashing out and just trying to attack Taylor on a ship surrounded by people that could kick her ass that we know immediately that whatever Taylor's planning is insane and we're in, we're totally in. Yeah. Right. And, uh, Tattletail plays the video from Glastic Winnie's body cam as Taylor pilots the craft toward the sea merg. And then we prepare for me to be totally right in the chapter. (laughs) So let's just get mentally prepared. Yep. Okay. I'm 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 in I'm in the zone. Let's go. <laughs> Twenty eight dot four. The dragonfly carrying its load of dangerous, uncooperative capes reaches the Simurg. And uh this is something I think I meant to bring up earlier, but I guess this is the time it works. Like not long ago we had Taylor like seven samurai in a force together to bring down Jack and she went around to all these other places and recruited capes to prevent the end of the world. And they were some of the finest heroes, right? We had Chevalier, we had Golem on this team and she did the same thing here. She went around and recruited people, but look who she's got. <laughs> she's got yeah. Sophia. She's got lung, these crazy people who don't play by the rules, who never played by the rules. And now that the end of the world is here, they're needed. And it's like a reflection of like, it, 
we need whatever we can get, whoever we can get. Here, my my seven samurai this time are just powerful people who are there. Yeah, I think she kind of mentally includes Rachel as being on this list of yeah. of of you know violent people with kind of a bad reputation, which is which is true and and fair, I suppose. We forget that that she kind of belongs on the list because we've seen her kind of reform and and, and we love her. But uh, yeah, she's she's been pretty violent. She's hurt a lot of innocent people. So yeah. Yep. Um, I, I I just I pulled out this tiny beat where uh she's thinking about how intimidating it is to approach the same and and she thinks that t- to make the psychic scream audible for lack of a better word purely for, for spreading fear then use it subtly at a time when she wasn't attacking so so basically she's considering the idea that that you don't that, that the same can affect you whether or not she's doing her psychic scream um and that the scream might just be like um. Uh, a trick basically um and i like that she considers this because this is something that i was thinking too like like this is exactly what you would do if your whole mo was was manipulation yeah i guess it's weird that your mind went there matt i guess you're just totally evil yeah i mean i i always think in terms of going backward and forward in time and I'm scared manipulating people's minds I'm very scared that's that's fine <laughs> let's let's move on from this Tattletail says uh, her confidence that she's right about her guess has has increased when they approach. Taylor reflects on the fact that she hasn't fought the Simurg before. She was presumed to be too unstable, and Dr. Yamada had politely declined to say that she was okay to fight her. Yamada burn? <laughs> um, I think the, the important thing we have to remember about that is that there's someone else on this plane that isn't very stable. Um, someone that puts up this this really, really good mask. But it's actually like constantly an emotional wreck underneath it. it. What if like the Embringer chooses a person like that to screw with? Yeah. What could I happen there? I don't know. This is a bad plan, Matt. <laughs> yeah. This seems seems desperate. Seems like they're desperate or something. Yeah. Almost as so, if. So one of the characters present, uh, I think it's Tattletail, um, just coincidentally, is the one who takes point and does all the talking. Taylor communicates the message with her swarm. The message is uh, then passed to the Seamurg through two chained together relay bugs. And as soon as Tattletail starts speaking, the Seamurg rotates to orient toward the dragonfly. That's so terrifying. Yeah. Tattletail tries to do her Tattletail thing, but has difficulty. Beyond the first response of facing their ship, Seamurg doesn't react at all, which doesn't give Lisa anything to go on, even when Lisa guesses that Eidolon created her. Holy shit. I'm very happy that I was right on that one. Um, it just fits so well, you know? Like, it's just yeah. like all the pieces come together. Like, everything that, that Eidolon's entire arc is trying to reinforce with us, it just fit. And Yeah. Although yeah. she's not 100% sure here, right? She's like, we even see it go down a little bit. She's down to 60% by the end of this, so. Yeah. I think that's just because she's not getting anything to go off of. But, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's one of those things where the words that Sion says make very little sense unless you apply that particular fit to them. Yeah. Taylor glances at a monitor that shows what's going on in the Pendragon, which is holding all of our favorite heroic characters, Defiant, Narwhal, Miss Militia, Saint, Canary, Perry and Foil, Golem, Vista, and Kid Wynn. It's a reunion. It's the normal people ship. <laughs> We're over here on the psychopath ship. Hooray. Yeah. I, I love the, the image of this. <laughs> So the hero capes in the other ship are hearing Tattletail's theory for the first time, and they are largely in disbelief. Yeah. They discuss other options for communicating with the Simurg, and Tattletail decides to try parahuman charades. So they move capes between ships, basically trying to create a certain impression. So they put forward Imp, Rachel, and Canary in order to project an attitude of nonviolence and expression of strength and a willingness to cooperate. And Lisa admits that she's reaching with all this. Yeah, this is like really thin. <laughs> this is like super thin. Um, but I guess like what's the worst that can happen? Yeah. Oh wait, everybody. Everybody dying. Yeah. That's yeah, that's the worst. Everybody dying on yeah, Im- immediately. So Taylor suggests sending Sophia instead of Aisha and and uh, an idea which Aisha adores. She says that Imp is too passive and Sophia, or at least Sophia's passenger, is more violent than she should be, according to her records. They decide to send both Imp and Shadow Soccer ultimately. Yeah, I love Imp throughout this entire thing. Uh, 
she's on an absolute roll here. Like she's so funny. And throughout all this, people are just totally ignoring her too. Like she's she's dropping in quips in between every what everyone else is saying, and they're just not listening to her at all. And it's even when she's an adult now, and she's still nobody nobody sees her. It's sad. Yeah. Um yeah. But we do we do this there's no way you'll ever get me to do this trope thing with Sophia. Like, and then everyone just successfully manipulates her into doing exactly what they wanted. Like almost immediately. It's really, it's really great. Yeah. Yeah. It's really fun. So the inbringer pays attention to the move, um, as they, as they shuttle people around outside the ships. Long tells them he, that he thinks this is ridiculous. I never thought I'd agree with long on something, but <laughs> I agree. So finally, when Canary starts singing, the Sumer promptly starts her song as well. Miss Militia tells them to wrap it up in five minutes. Yeah, so this is going just really well so far. It's really, yeah. really going great. And then they keep trying to talk to her, but Lisa becomes increasingly frustrated with the lack of further response. They consider how to simplify the message that they're trying to communicate. Uh, so for the nth time this arc, uh, Rachel is the one with the insight. And she points out that the inbringers do seem to feel anger. Yeah, and here we go again. Rachel for MVP of ARC. Um and I think like it, it kind of makes sense, right? We're we're dealing with these these things are not human. They don't have human emotions, they don't process things like humans do, and Rachel sees and understands things differently and has a different way of looking at things that are not exactly clear to a person who thinks just like a human being. So she can see those solutions when others can't. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. She's used to thinking from non-human perspectives. Yeah. So Telltale guesses that the Seamurg was planning one last big attack on humanity to, to try to validate her existence in some way, <laughs> since her real purpose is gone now. And this gets a reaction, or maybe it's just Leviathan arriving that catches Seamurg's attention. Maybe it's both. Maybe she's the one that told Leviathan to show up. Yeah, right. Lisa goes on to argue that fighting and killing Scion is a better way to prove the worth of the Inbringers than crushing humanity would be. Yeah, and I think like the thing you kind of forget in this whole thing that that while Tattletail is talking, uh, Taylor is copying the thing she's saying with her swarm. So the, the audible thing that everyone can hear is Taylor in swarm speech. And she's now like, she's not just copying words, she's copying tone, she's copying like rhythm of talking. And we know that here because it says Tattletail was almost breathless, speaking faster with more emotion. It was a challenge to convey that with a voice generated by the swarm. And here's here's our communication thing coming back again that she's literally communicating for her. Yeah, it's also just fun to note that the first time she tried to speak with her bugs, she was almost unintelligible. And now she's almost, you know, creating a facsimile of a real human voice. Yeah, she's basically like, uh, was it Screamer? What was the? Yeah creepy yeah. as shit cape yeah yeah tunnel starts insinuating that maybe there's nothing to the simurg after all maybe she's an empty projection and the simurg responds by nudging the dragon ships with her telekinesis she nudges a bit harder when lisa doesn't stop <laughs> not real huh well check this shit out um, <laughs> <laughs> and it, we see like how much how much title tale is just playing with fire here like how wrong this could go at any moment yeah yeah so Lisa says that she thinks this is the closest they've come to communicating with a passenger or, or a shard, I suppose. Um, the shell? No. The outer shell, the concept, the execution. They're tapping into religious metaphors. The devil, the serpent, the angel, Buddha, Mother Earth, the maiden, each connected in turn to fundamental forces. Flame, water, fate, time, earth, the self. Things deep-seated in the fundamental uh, and fundamental to their creator's belief system. Because that's how the passengers interpret our world, through us. So I'm, I'm bringing this up to give you credit for that pseudo-prediction you made about the Inbringers and their nature a long time yeah. ago. Yeah, it was so long ago that I barely remembered that until this moment. Um, I think I said specifically that they represented the fundamental elements of the planet, right? Like earth, water, fire, um, heart, yeah. air. Um, yeah. So it wasn't quite right, but it was close. Um, yeah. But but that there, the, I think someone on the Reddit also commented about the fact that we're being subtly primed to to see Idolan as vaguely religious. He he mentions priests a few times. Yeah, uh, he's yeah, yeah yeah. And I mean, he's called the high priest, right? That's what the, right. the uh, Glastic calls him. And yeah, so I mean, it, it they're all named after gods, like they're named after mythological 
like god creature so yeah like it 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 does seem to fit in with idolan's image and his beliefs and interpretations of his shard and i think the most important thing here is is obviously he was not aware that he did this um that's that's why scion's thing was a reveal to him that's why it shocked him because it was not something he was conscious of so i don't know if it's it's his shard or his power doing this or or something else but um but yeah i mean it, it fed off of of his belief system and and his interpretation of the world yeah so here um, they see that Leviathan is following one of the dragon ships and the Simurg follows another. And it looks like it worked. <laughs> this like is the closest I've gotten in this book so far of pushing past the realm of believability. Like I get really close to like this actually worked. They just recruited Endbringers now. But it, I mean, it still, of course, makes sense within world. It's not technically breaking any of the rules established by the world, especially because we're in a place where we never were before, where the, the person that created these things doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. And and really, when you think about it, like you have to go well outside the box of of plausible solutions because it's hard to imagine them standing up to Scion without something kind of completely out of left field, something completely unbelievable. Yeah. Um, it yeah. makes you wonder if this was Wild Bo's plan. You know, how how... How late into the creation of this turn of events did Wild Bill come up with this idea? Yeah, good question. I don't know. Uh, there might be a there might be some some word of God on that, but I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, we'll find out. Yeah, we'll get there. So now the Pendragon flies to the rescue of a settlement of Australian refugees on Earth Tav. The Yangban are brutally attacking the people, and the Pendragon takes some hits as it flies in. Simurg follows dramatically after and begins whipping up a telekinetic storm. The Yangban stop in their tracks. <laughs> Can you just be in, like imagine being in the middle of a fight and then like the ship shows up through a portal and you're like, oh, we can take these guys. And oh, holy shit, it's an endbringer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, it's, that's a bad it's day. It's one of the many fun moments where they're just, they, they just like freeze and yeah. they just like stop using their, their power. They're just yeah. paralyzed. The Simring makes a variety of guns, which Kidwin recognizes as his own technology, and blows away a bunch of Yangban, directly throwing some of them into the sky with her telekinesis. The good guys have an ugly feeling about all this, particularly because she keeps up her psychic scream the whole time. Um, so we have this moment where, where Taylor talks about this bad feeling, and Lung says, mm, this is true. But I've seen what happens if you do something like this, something big, and you fall. You fall hard. I nodded at that. Wise words, Lung. Well said. Do not talk to me. He rumbled. <laughs> I only shook my head. So that's a great moment. But yeah. I think what all this does, and what the end of this chapter really does, is sell the level of discomfort with this whole plan. Um, not only is it in the character's words, yeah, but it's everything else. It's like we can't this is the Seamurg. It like it can see the future and it fucks with people's minds. That's what it does. And we've seen the full breadth of that up close and personal. We've seen what it did to the travelers. We've seen how that plan extended all the way out, all the way out into the the behemoth fight. Yeah. Yeah. A- and how many bystanders are going to be hurt by this? If not directly, then indirectly in their desperation, the heroes have turned to their greatest enemies to stop the new one. It, it's certainly poetic, but it's, it's really deeply troubling that in their desperation, they are allying themselves with this thing that they, they don't fully understand. And they know they don't understand it. And they know that it works in ways that they can't see until it's too late. Right. Yeah. It's especially troubling in the Sumer's case because you know, we get a glimpse inside her her head, such as such as it is later on, and we see this idea where not only is she setting up billiard balls, but she's setting up a chain of billiard balls where the desired effect is several hits down the line. Um, and so, even like even though she her actions seem like they're cooperative and benign, and in the proximal sense, we have no idea what what she's actually going for. You know? Yeah. 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 So the other in- inbringers, uh, Bohu and Leviathan, are on their way to deal with the other threats. So they're uh, they're in line too. Uh, nothing says this isn't another clever plan set up to fuck us, to fuck with us, destroy our last shreds of hope. I said. At this, the Seamurg looks at Taylor. <laughs> oh my God! So 
it, the, the Seamurk does this a few times, right? That turns and looks yeah. at people. And we learn later in the arc that she can't see. That yeah. she doesn't see anything in the present. So so the entire turning and looking is just to mentally fuck with you. That's the yeah. sole purpose of it. And it's terrifying. It's terrifying when you don't know that and it becomes equally terrifying. Like it like even it expands upon that once you figure that out. Yeah. She's like, I'm going to make the calculated movement of my body just to disturb this person deeply in a way that <laughs> sticks with them. Right. And influences their behavior at some later point. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So into 28.5, after the fight, the Seamurg is dormant, surrounded by her ring of weapons. Taylor reflects on how, if this is all a ploy, she's listened to the song for far too long and is now feeling paranoid and paranoid about her paranoia. And how many people exposed to the Seamurg might drive themselves crazy just from this kind of paranoia? Yeah, so maybe this whole let's see if she'll be nice to us and point her in the right direction plan was maybe, I don't know, short-sighted? Yeah. Maybe it does. Yeah, but it does seem a little simplistic to take the the th- three dimensional chess player and ringer and, and act like they're going to manipulate her. But yeah, yeah. Whatever. yeah. So it turns out two Earths have been destroyed. One one lost to Scion and the other to the Sleeper, but a dozen accessible ones remain. The Sleeper just eats planets, Matt. It's just it's just eating planets, and everyone's like, "Well, we got bigger things to deal with right now." What the fuck is this thing? <laughs> Uh, you know, it's the sleeper. Oh, okay. It's a giant so, Velius dragon. Yeah, right. So Lisa remarks that the worst thing Scion could do would be take a break for a couple months because it would throw off all their alliance building and inbringer wrangling work. Lisa, you really got to stop saying these things out loud. Like, this is why Regent needed to be here because he, he knows the rules. Yeah, right. He understood the narrative. Actually, he clearly didn't. Because, well, yeah, he he you know. doomed himself. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. So they meet Defiant and discuss how few casualties the Seamurg calls uh, caused. Yeah, only a few innocent people died. Hooray! Um, it's interesting also that they say the death and two of the injuries were the Seamurg's fault. And it's like, oh, okay. So even though it's here because you specifically brought her here, it's, it's her fault. We're not responsible for that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's not the, not the only time in this arc they play a little fast and loose with the concept of Signing blame. Mm -hmm. Uh, So this leads to wondering who exactly is controlling the Inbringer because it's following their ship, but they're not actually sure who specifically it's following. Taylor mentions uh, the look that it gave her and advocates that they speak of the Seamurg respectfully just in case she has emotions that could be offended. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) If if this is if this is the closest thing to talking directly to a shard that we've seen, maybe maybe being cautious is pretty good because we've we've talked we've seen what happens when a shard takes over, Kidna. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Um, so another another one of these funny beats in passing that comes up. Uh, Canary mentions um, that she she had a, a social awkward with some people, and she says, "Yeah, there were these two people I was talking to." Forget their names. One's really forgettable and the other's obscure. Boyle and Perry and I said, which I just laughed out loud because <laughs> it's it's like, yeah, of course, of course those two. Yeah. Forgettable and obscure. Yeah. Yeah. It's their names, but also their personalities. Burnt. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. They're great. Burn on Foyle. Or maybe Burn on Cana- uh, Burn on Perry. I don't know. Burn anyway. on. Uh, I don't know. Both? Yeah. Both. Yeah. Neither? Neither. Yeah. <laughs> So they explain to Canary and Foil and uh, to Canary that Foil and Parian excluded her so they could go do sex things together. Then Imp insinuates that she and Taylor also enjoy sex things. It's all very comical. Well, it's sort of comical. It's more like Imp is taking serious things very lightly. Yeah, it's, it's another Imp behaving ridiculous moment. Like, again, like she always behaves ridiculously, but this is this is like elevated to another level. And it's. I think I think it's very easy if you don't follow my Brian is actually dead theory that you could write this off as just Imp's coping mechanism that that she's dealing with the impending their impending death and the impending end of the world by just being as goofy as possible and that's absolutely part of it sure but I, I think it's it's her dealing with her emotions it's her dealing with uh, being forced to hide her brother's death from Taylor because presumably she would have to know about it um, and. I don't know. And it's also her changing. It's a lot of things, but Brian's dead, Matt. 
<laughs> guess we'll see about all that, Scott. So a bit later, Canary finishes telling Taylor what went on with Lung in prison, um, which we knew a, a lot of it, but we didn't know, I think, that he avoided using his power almost entirely beyond the big show of force when he killed Bakura and several others. And Taylor isn't sure why he he held back like that. Yeah, it's more more fun with dramatic irony, right? Because mm-hmm. we know we know that Lung's power escalates quicker when he spends time charging it. And now we know that he's been charging it for uh, years. Yeah. <laughs> and and like I love this because uh, Taylor and and company are surrounded by enemies at this point. Like we have the Seamurg there who we don't really understand. And we know now that like she sees Lung as an enemy. She recognizes that this Lung and Sophia are people they can't fully trust. But she, the dramatic irony in the situation allows it. So we know that she's even in more danger than she thinks she is because she understands Lung's power as one that takes time to ramp up. But how fast is it going to go if he's been charging it for this long? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's all completely true. Yeah. yeah. Um. So the next we we have a, a, another bit from Imp. <laughs> um. No, I'm not talking about that, Imp said. I'm talking about the fact that Lustrum, the feminazi, was in charge of your cell block and you still didn't pick up on the thing between Perrin and Foil? Isn't that like Sappho Central? Sappho. Canary blushed again. I, uh... <laughs> so Matt, Aisha is reading ancient Greek poetry. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. She's, Sappho, uh... and not only reading it, but clearly understanding on a level to make these plucky fun references. Yeah, yeah. I think so she's, she's got a stack of classics on her nightstand. Yeah. So, yeah, they, they head off to their next meeting, the Seamurg following with a Gladius, apparently. Yeah, this feels like a good time to mention something I talked to you about earlier, which was that I always artificially inflate the size of the Endbringers in my head. Like, I always make them Godzilla-sized, even though the text specifically says they're not. Like, so there was this moment where it says that the Seamurg's Gladius was four feet long, and I was like, What? It's tiny. She's enormous. And then I was like, wait a minute. No, she's not. She's not actually that, that tall. Just yeah. like too human size. Right. And and then Le- Leviathan, I think, is always a bit smaller than I than I mentally picture. Yeah. Particularly because he's the one who kind of looks the most like Godzilla. But uh, I think the behemoth's pretty big, though. Yeah. Still not Godzilla size, though, but, but big enough. No. Yeah. Although, which Godzilla, Scott? Ah, uh, that's a good question, because they, <laughs> they vary greatly. Yes, they do. So they move through a portal to the site of Leviathan's attack on the elite, and they find a large structure, a walled city, built by the Cape Agnes Court, uh, the elite cape who can grow and solidify structures, and it's been destroyed by a Leviathan. Oh no, I said, the civilians, the refugees. We're relatively few, Tattletail said. That's, yeah, I don't think we off people in any substantial numbers. In any substantial numbers, I thought. So it looks like they probably killed Agnes Court, too, the cape who can build cities. Good job, guys. Yeah, uh, I think we're going to get into this in, in a bit, but uh, Jesus, this yeah. is uh, this is what happens when you're hanging out with Endbringers. Yeah, right. So there's a, there's a group of people below, and the Dragonfly lands to parlay with them. It's the other cape groups, the Thanda, Faultline, the Irregulars, the Meisters, the Suits, and Cauldron. This is the first real gathering of the disparate groups since the oil rig attack, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, that's absolutely right. And it's time for Taylor and company to make their play some sort of, you know, big show of force to indicate they mean business and, and a plea for people to join them. I wonder how they can effectively do that with, oh my god. So to punctuate their arrival, the Seamurg plummets from the sky and nails Leviathan with a gladius. Uh, it looks for a bit like Leviathan is dead. In fact, everyone starts to react as if this is the case. But eventually he gets up and then sprouts fins all over his body, which then sport Xanothorn upgrades. Yep, it's Mecha Leviathan, as Imp absolutely puts it. Um, so this this absolutely makes sense in the world. The Seamurg borrows Tinker tech, and she has a greater understanding of, of how Endbringers work. And can and so she uses Defiance power and presumably some other powers to come up with a way of spreading this tech into Leviathan. Sure, that that checks out. But I don't know. This is like this came off as very silly to me. <laughs> and I tried really hard to come up with a better like reason 
for why this felt weird to me other than just like it's very video game like second form upgrading type of thing um i don't think that's like a knock on the writing at all it's just like personally this felt silly to me i don't know yeah i think i can see that i'm pretty sure i just thought it was awesome but i can i I think i can feel it there (laughs) yeah i mean it's it's definitely a a little bit tonally different than the kind of because because leviathan was was basically a straight up terrifying thing before yeah it's like it's not like i felt like oh you know what would be better is if leviathan was more deadly because he like he was already not only was he plenty deadly but it was clear that he was holding back anyway yeah so so it uh, just maybe unnecessary i guess um yeah i mean but like it it fits in the themes and it fits in the the rules of the world like it's not like breaking anything i don't know i just i don't know it's hard it's hard to explain yeah yeah i know what you mean i mean that maybe the, the the strongest argument for it would be like actually maybe it has more to do with the simmer is doing this as like a psychological move to show everyone present what she can do and it's part of one of her plans i don't know i don't know yeah it certainly yeah. would make sense yeah yeah so the doctor does seem to be perturbed by this which is gratifying yeah i take it all back uh mech leviathan <laughs> is worth it just to see mom doc lose her mind <laughs> again like we've seen her pretty chill except for the getting slightly perturbed at um lisa at the beginning of the arc She's been pretty chill and she just loses her shit in this moment. <laughs> like she like Uber Leviathan stands up and she just looks at Tattletale and is like, what the, and she can't even finish the thought. It's yeah. like, nobody saw this coming. Not even the people who see everything coming saw this coming. Right. And, and that's one of those, I mean, it is a cool moment of like, of like giving you a shred of hope that even cauldron who have been so smug about this idea that like, Mm -hmm. Oh, we have Contessa and we always had everything planned out 15 steps ahead. And this, this catches them off guard and it, and you know, they're like, okay, okay. You know, maybe something promising happening here. Yeah. Yeah. But then the capes present agree that the inbringers should be kept separated because humanity may have to fight them again at some (laughs) point. Yeah. Uh, good, good call. Good call. Yeah. Um, I hope you can understand why we're distressed with you, the doctor said. Fuck you, Tattletail retorted. Cope. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great moment, and the only thing better than it is um, when Taylor then steps up, because you, she can tell that uh, Tattletail is agitated, and she steps up and like calmly centers herself before uh-huh. also just saying fuck you. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, I, I love that moment, too. Yeah, I remember exactly what you're talking about. Ahem. <clears throat> Fuck you, yeah. So, <laughs> so so the doctor argues that attacking the Yangban and the elite was wasteful. The Yangban could have been brought in line and the elite were an asset. Taylor and her team respond that both groups broke the truce. And the only thing keeping the truce in effect is the promise of swift retaliation if it's broken. Yeah, so let's talk about this for a bit, Matt. Because, like, uh, the Yangban are a terrible group that's, they're, they're a cult that, that brainwashes members and forces them to serve, and they were in the middle of attacking and killing civilians to seize their territory. And I agree that those guys needed to be stopped. But we get to the elite, and the elite were setting up a community. They were recruiting civ- civilians and, and letting them pay with either money or skill to, to create the place. So they were only picking the people that they wanted or the people that could pay. Um, they're not great people, but they weren't attacking people. They weren't killing people. And they were just totally, cruelly wiped out. And with a not substantial number of civilians... <laughs> Which is, uh, how many is that? Like, wh- what are we using? Like, what's our measuring stick for that? We never, we never really go into it. Yeah, right. Just, it does seem to harken back to some old school skitter psychology where yeah. it's like, if you're not, if you're not cooperating with me, then I need to grind you under my heel um, as dramatically as possible um, and fill your eyeballs with maggots to show everyone <laughs> that 
you sh- that that, ever, that you should listen to me and that we should all cooperate and we should all be friends. Thanks. Right. Because the, as much as this was, let's stop the bad people from doing bad things. This was also a show of force. This was a, a decision to hopefully unite the rest of the people after they see what we're capable of. Um, and it seems like this we have to stop Scion thing has now become like an excuse to justify any and all behavior, no matter what we do. And that's kind of cauldronish, right? Like that's very reminiscent of the level that they are willing to, to do things. The thing that, that Taylor was so disgusted by and said she regretted so much behaving in that, that kind of fashion. Yeah. Part of this also feels a bit like a slip up because it's like they went with the Seamer, they saw what the Seamer did and then they're just like, okay, well let's go check in and see what Leviathan. Oh my God. And it's like if you almost get the feeling if they had been with Leviathan, they they would have, to the extent that the control over the Endbringers works, they could have been like, hey, hey, back off. This isn't yeah. what we wanted, you know, yeah. um, but maybe not. I don't know. But that's the consequence when you're brandishing these all powerful weapons that you don't fully control. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. So apparently Kansu has imprinted on teachers group which is just great to hear. <laughs> um, and teacher is offering to sell the inbringer, which is even better. Yay. The doctor tells him, tells them all to leave uh, Tohu for another party to claim. Hey, hey Matt, the inbringers are nuclear weapons. Oh. Um, <laughs> like this, this metaphor fits so well because not only do we have, one person unlocks the ability to wield the weapons. And then suddenly before you even realize it, others have done the same thing and we've shifted the power dynamic so suddenly. And then all of a sudden other people have these things and they're using them too. And they might not have our best interest at heart when they're using them. Um, and if you want to complete that metaphor perfectly, you can see that the people that discovered the power first used it twice as a demonstration of what it can do, which yeah. is literally nuclear weapons. That's yeah. what it is. And then and we get mutually assured destruction. Yeah, it's great. And and uh And you can never go back. Once once you have unlocked this thing, once you have shown this, you can never go back. Yeah. Yeah. And just like in real history, how all of the uh nations had to band together to use their n- nuclear weapons to fight um the alien monster. Okay, it's not perfect. <laughs> okay. All it's right. close. It's close. Oh, it, it, you're right, yeah. I, I like it, yeah. Um, yeah, so I doubt, uh, Taylor thinks, I doubted anyone but the perception thinkers on the other side could see, but Tattletail was clenching her jaw in an effort to keep her teeth from chattering. I felt just a little, little warmer owing to my hood. Yeah, and one of the recurring things in Worm, um, but we see multiple times is Taylor's complete inability to see when Lisa is freaking the fuck out. <laughs> she can't see it. We saw it back during the Echidna stuff. Uh, that that she just wasn't fully aware of the shit Lisa was going through. And I think we're seeing it again here. Tattletail is clenching her jaw in an effort to keep her teeth from chattering. And Taylor's like, oh, yeah, she's just she's probably cold. I'm not cold because I have my hood. And it's like, maybe it's because she's terrified out of her mind. <laughs> like, she doesn't know what she's doing. She's in this really tense situation. Her endbringer control is just, like, led to the death of a bunch of people. And she's freaking the fuck out. Maybe it's that. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think Taylor projects how Taylor is on other people a lot and assumes that they all have this like battle computer mindset, but I don't think that's how Lisa's mind works on the inside at all. Yeah. Yeah. So the doctor admits that with the inbringers on their side, this is more firepower than they expected to have, uh, which kind of harkens back to that comment I made about them having, you know, this giving us some hope. Um, so Cauldron will now bring forth more case 53s. They all agree to split their forces into five groups, four groups each having their own inbringer, and the last one comprised of dragon and teacher's forces. Yeah, so I don't know if I'm going to regret going down this line of thinking, but it gets into this really complicated cause and effect chainy type of stuff um, because we see here that Dinah's prophecy from way back when is coming true that there's going to be five armies. Uh, up against scion but it's only coming true because she shared it because they're separating into five groups because dinah told taylor to separate into five groups her idea with the endbringers stemmed from that knowledge too so like how much 
of this is things that were going to happen and how much of it is things that are happening now because they were shaped by the sharing of that premonition. And yeah. now, now my, my head hurts. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think this is the type of future site where probably a lot of it has been shaped by Dynate either intentionally or, or, or unintentionally. But I mean, uh, a huge amount of the plot so far was instigated by her cut ties note. Right. Um, right. And isn't so. that, isn't that interesting, right? Cause if we, if we break that down, she left the undersiders because of, of what Dinah said. She went down this road because of what Dinah said. And now she said that she regretted it, right? She said mm-hmm. that she regretted making those decisions. She regretted leaving those people. She regretted doing those things. And she did them because Dinah told her to. And now she's, doing it again <laughs> she's mm-hmm. she's acting in a way that fulfills the prophecy that diana gave to her and it's like taylor you can't you can't you see that you see that yeah you see what we're doing what what are you going to do next because you think it's part of a prophecy or or it's what diana told you to do yeah i, I don't remember the details of what diana said I don't, I don't remember if she was like yeah in in the worlds where things go better in the futures where things go better, I see five groups or if she was just like, I always see five groups. I don't know. Cause I think, I think she, the, the always was Taylor is always there. The five mm-hmm. groups. Sometimes oh. there's five groups. Sometimes there's not. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, that makes sense. So at this point, um, Taylor, uh, the, uh, the doctor says, I would recommend, that you take your time to visit loved ones, say goodbyes, and make your peace. I don't think there will be another fight after this. It's a hell of a way to end a chapter there. Yep. But we, we got one more main chapter in this arc, though. Yep. So looking over the beauty of nature, Taylor thinks idly about just walking away from all this. She considers uh, what that would be like, but ultimately it's a fantasy. It's not in her nature to, to do that. Yeah, and I think we've talked about this before, that this is both Taylor's fundamental strength and her fundamental flaw, that that she has to act. She has to be active. Passivity, not an option. That that peaceful life, the nature, the quiet, not an option for her. And you can say it's because of her shard, um, but it's also because of her trauma, the, the, her trauma and forcing her into a passive role, like trapping her in that locker, nothing she can do. She needs to be in control and she needs to do something. And this both makes her a hero and also makes me terrified of what she could be capable of when she's truly pushed. And this is a, a, a thought that's echoed from my head the entire time we've read this book and we've seen her do bad things. We've seen her do good things. Um, and I don't know where this is going to end. Yeah. Yeah. So we just have to hold on. Yeah. So Rachel approaches her and gives her a physical nudge, seemingly sensing that she needs some human affirmation. Yeah, it's like when your puppy walks up to you and just puts their head on you just to be like, hey, just wanted to let you know I'm still here and I love you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's exactly. Adorable. Imp makes an elaborate metaphor comparing their circumstances to the situation from hacky TV shows where a kid and an abusive owner see which one of them the dog will come back to um, and has a roundabout point about how life Sometimes it doesn't work out PG. Yeah. Um, it, it's like anything in, in Wild Bill Works. This works in two ways, right? It works literally because that's what they're about to do in reverse with the Endbringer. Um, but then that idea that sometimes the ending doesn't, things don't work out. The ending isn't good. Like w- this, I am more convinced than ever that this story is going to end tragically. We are in a tragedy. This is a tragedy. I've been sensing this for a while now. This kind of confirms it, that we're going to get to a point where everything that that taylor has been fighting against internally is going to get to a breaking point and she's going to make a choice that is going to destroy her or others and it's going to end maybe the world will be saved probably the world will be saved but it's going to be tragic it's not going to be your your rosy you know saturday afternoon tv show thing yeah yeah um no comment but uh (laughs) But but yeah, the, 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 it, it is interesting because you're not really sure what they're doing. You're not really sure what Imp's talking about. And then you realize that, yeah, they, they're all going to walk in different directions and they're going to see who the Seamer follows. And yep. of course, kind of no one wants to be the one who it follows. <laughs> um, but it, it does follow Tattletale. Um, but but then, of course, Taylor is kind of miffed about this. And <laughs> she thinks 
uh, some of that was on Tattletail's behalf. Of course, the Seamurg had picked her to follow. Tattletail had done the talking. Tattletail was a thinker, just like the Seamurg. She was the de facto leader of the Undersiders in many respects. But a small part of me had hoped that the Seamurg had picked me to follow. That same part of me had almost believed it, taken it for granted. It was horrible and scary and almost wrong, having an inbringer at one's beck and call. But I had been prepared to shoulder the burden. I wanted to handle it, so people I cared about wouldn't have to. Another part of me? Maybe it had wanted her to be stuck to me, just so just to have one more ank- uh, tether keeping me connected at a point where I felt like I wasn't very connected at all. And perhaps I wanted to have the power so close to hand so I could be relevant. <laughs> This is Taylor, like summed up in a nutshell. Each each one of these paragraphs reflects a different part of Taylor's personality, right? Mm-hmm. We have mm-hmm. um, the logical side. We have the um, uh, weight of the world on her shoulder side. We have the desire to be accepted and to be part of something and the desire to be relevant all wrapped up here in a nice little bow. It's all here. And I love, I love this talk about Tether. She, she talked about this when she was threatening to leave or or not threatening, just, just thinking about leaving. Um, but she, she said she couldn't because she has too many things connecting her to this world, to this, this mission. Uh, she lists Rachel as one, which is great. But we all know her biggest Tether is, is her trauma. And it's almost the only one that matters. It, it, It literally pulls her to act. And I think those other tethers, the ones she thinks about are, are are the ones that connect her to other people that are tethering her to her humanity. And I think that's what's at stake here. Yeah. Yeah. I I think you're right. Yeah. Um, I don't think that, I don't think having the Simmerg following her around would have been a very good tether. No, I don't don't think so either. It would have been highly alienating actually. Yeah. And it is interesting here because we see Taylor kind of debase herself again. Right. She she shrinks herself down to her core elements. She describes herself as just a hundred and thirty pound girl with the power to control bugs. That's all she is. It, take everything else away. And that's all she is. And we know we know better than that. Like we know the full extent of Taylor's power. We know how powerful she is. Um, but but this is a reflection of what we saw in that first chapter, that inability to put herself in that upper echelon with Eidolon, that that she decides to compare herself to Uber more instead. Um, and this is a reflection of something you said earlier, too, that Taylor always needs more power. She never feels like she has enough. She's reaching for more and more tools to put in that toolbox as a way of dealing with this perceived weakness that she has, this perceived lack of power. And this is just another one. Like, I don't think I'm going to be any use in this fight. So I wanted this thing attached to me so I could be relevant. Um, even though, like, of course she's relevant. She's super powerful. Like, she killed Alexandria. She is extremely powerful extremely smart but she she needs it all she constantly needs it yeah i agree with you that that this whole passage is awesome because it it gives us a a very clear look into into her head and all the different elements that make her up and uh and and we we've sort of we've heard all these voices kind of have their their role at various times in the story but this is a neat a neat chance where she she's reacting to one event in a number of different ways at the same time. And I think that's very realistic and, and great writing too. Yeah. And I think it, we wouldn't have been able to see this from these multiple angles if she didn't have some sort of realization in the mm-hmm. last arc that she's, she's understanding what she does and how she does it. She has a greater understanding of who she is and therefore can process this thing from all those different sections of her personality. Yeah, it's a good point. Like it's a kind of self-awareness that integrates more information about who she is. Yeah. I like that. So yeah, so now that they know that Tattletail is the one that Simmer is following, it means that Tattletail will have to stay in place. And it's also pretty disturbing to Lisa to find this out. And she's having a harder and harder time keeping up the bravado. She tells Taylor that she's deduced that Scion has Contessa's power from the video feeds from uh, Classic Winye. And it's quite a blow for Taylor to hear this, but even now she's thinking about how all the rough powers they fought before had weaknesses, even ways in which a strength could be turned against itself. But this argument doesn't really convince Lisa because Lisa points out that all of those weaknesses were put there by Scion. Yeah, this is a a great little conversation. And we see here that even even when the worst is told to her, like Taylor can't quit. Like she takes that hopeless information and she processes it and she shoves it off in the corner where it belongs and says, we'll deal with it. And yeah. like, this is just a wonderful, beautiful moment between these two friends who are trying yeah. to convince each other of something. Right. 
because because even now Taylor's still doing that. She retorts that if Scion is prepared for every conceivable scenario, they just need to create an in, inconceivable scenario. That's that's worrying. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? So so at this point, Taylor finally realizes that Lisa is barely holding it together, and she stops her, giving her an apparently much needed hug. Um, I could. I could feel her fingernails against the fabric of my suit at my back. Fuck this. I hate feeling so dumb. So much shit I don't know. Shit I can't know. Like fucking Ziz here. Fuck, I've barely, even, I've barely ever given a crap about anyone except myself and my friends, and now I'm fucking caring what happens to everyone when I can't do anything about it. I held on. I could have gone on, told her that there were ways to cheat, that with all the powers in the world there had to be ways to cheat, but she didn't need reassurances. She was a master of bluffing, wore a mask better than anyone I knew, and she'd adopted her persona in a way nobody else in the Undersiders or Wards had. In the midst of all this, she'd been a pillar, a source that everyone had been turning to when they had questions. Uh, it's so good. We yeah. see this this mask of Lisa break just a little bit, and the, the truth of how she's actually doing come out. And I, I love that, that Taylor finally notices it, finally sees it here, that she's barely holding it together. But the mask doesn't completely break, because... She still ends this whole thing fucking with Taylor a bit, like making it seem yeah. like she was crying when she wasn't. Yeah, that's kind of funny. Was I mean, was she just being funny? I, I'm not sure exactly. I, I, I mean, I think it's part of her mask. I think she like there, there's a way you can read this that like all this was just her fucking with Taylor because Taylor once again was trying to babysit her and, and make her feel better and she didn't need it. So she just messing with her. But it's I think it's a little of both. I think she had a moment where like all the stuff she said she was, was true. This really affected her. This really how she feeling. And then in a moment of discomfort because of that mask cracked a little bit, she went right back to trickery and, yeah. um, and that's, tried to play it off. Even yeah, though it was, exactly. It was yeah. legitimately needed in that moment. Yeah. And, and I think part of it, like Taylor's letting her have that cause she's like letting her have her dignity in a yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. So Taylor heads to touch base with all the other important people she checks in on charlotte and her former minions she finds out that they're doing okay and and uh seeing that they are she feels kind of out of place yeah it's always kind of weird when you find out that the people who needed you so much once upon a time don't need you anymore it's yeah. like if, if taylor had been a mother to the people of the docks the people of her territory this is kind of her realizing that her children are all grown up now yeah yeah i like that Forrest shows up and mentions that Cauldron came by offering vials and the group refused. Um, these humans have far too much familiarity with the troubles that really come with being parahuman. Yeah, and this is pretty huge, right? I mean, this is a big deal because yeah. we've talked so much about how about trauma and how trauma feeds that that need for power for f to get a tool to do something about the things that have damaged and broken you we've seen that represented with capes they they go through this trauma and they gain a power and they use that power to fight back against the, their trauma but we've seen it in non-capes as well you know pigo tag saint these people grasp for power in order to deal with their trauma a and here we have Taylor's old people, people who have witnessed the destruction, rebirth, and then destruction again of Brockton Bay have survived more trauma than most people ever have. And, and as we'll learn in a bit, are barely hanging on. But here their leaders choose not to grasp for that power. They say no, they deny it. And why do they do it? For, for that exact reason that you indicated, because they've seen what it's done to Taylor and what Taylor has done with it. And they don't. They don't want that. They reject that. And it's so amazing. It's so different from anything we've seen in the story so far. Right, right. Because that, that power is so seductive and we've seen it seduce almost everyone. And, and these people have, have the collective wisdom to, to see it for the, the, the poison that it is and, yep. and to turn it down. I think it's great. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Something that I, I don't know. I wish I had the wisdom to apply in real life to say like, yeah, you know what? That's, that's, it's tempting to think that if you could control something better, that that would be better for you. Yeah. But how often is that really true? Yeah. This leaves me with a little hope for, for humanity, right? Like if, yeah. if everyone makes it out of this thing alive, there's, there's, there's sun on that horizon somewhere that people, people when given the chance to grasp for more power have said no. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And then it goes to, uh, I heaved out a sigh, realized in the process that I'd been holding my breath. Good. That's all really, 
I just, and then she thinks, needed a reminder about what I'm fighting for before the last fight. Yeah, that's all, I said. And then a little bit later, when she's she's walking away, but she's she's walking away, but she can still hear them through her bugs. And you said we're going to have a leaning winter if we don't get more vegetables out of the garden. So why do you say we were doing okay? Because we are, Forrest said. Bugs I'd planted on his sleeve tracked his movement as he wrapped an arm around Charlotte's shoulders, pulling her close. We owe her everything, Charlotte said. That's enough in the big picture. Oh my God, I almost cried. <laughs> yeah. And I love that Taylor can't help but be Taylor and say, well, Charlotte would have known that I was still listening in. So she just said this for me. But it didn't even matter. It still meant the world to me. Yeah. And I don't know if that's true. I don't know if if Charlotte was just saying that for Taylor. Um, I think she believes it regardless. Yeah, I, I think she does. Yeah, I, I don't think it was fake. I yeah. think, uh, I mean, yeah. Even if she was saying it for Taylor, I don't think it was fake. Yeah, no. it's it's a, it's a absolutely beautiful moment to show, like, the best side of her, the best that she does, the 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 stepping into this territory and helping these people. She saved these people, and we owe her everything. It's beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. So next, Taylor visits fan favorites Glenn Chambers and Quinn Kaye. The pair of them, normals with, with a lot of cape knowledge, are keeping themselves busy vetting capes, releasing them from prison if they could be useful. She thanks them both for their roles in mentoring her, but she annoys Glenn when she says she doesn't think heroics work in this world. He points out Chalier as an example. Yeah, I'm wondering what your opinion on this. Do you, do you side more with Taylor that true heroics don't work? Because, I mean, Glenn does counter with, with Chevalier, who is, yeah, a, a great hero, but He's also currently like almost dead lying in a hotel bed. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think I think Taylor's view of, of all this is more simplistic than Glenn's. I mean, I think it's it's kind of cool actually because he is more mature than her and and has like a more nuanced view about these things and, yeah. and may, more more evolved view of them. Maybe like I I definitely think that his view of heroism is probably just nuanced enough to incorporate the kinds of things that she would want to incorporate if she thought it through. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I think um, that sounds reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Glenn shows her that they're considering Uber for release and apparently Leet was killed and Uber spent some time working with circus before ending up in jail. I think it's kind of fun that we have Taylor help decide Uber's fate here when we had her directly compare herself to him earlier in this arc. Like that moment um, kind of seemed out of the blue that we're suddenly talking about Uber again, but it makes much more sense now that we kind of complete it with this moment. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot where it's, it's, uh, it's connecting those two things. And at first it was just like, Oh yeah, a really crappy Cape like Uber. But then what's funny is that she was thinking of Uber as, as a crappy Cape with a crappy, you know, a power basically. And now she's like, yeah, Uber's really useful. Uber's, Uber's yeah. great. Yeah, you should really, you could really use him. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think, in fact, I think he's really awesome. And the only problem is that he was uh, hamstrung by Leet all along. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Not very consistent, are we? No, no. Um, yeah, so she tells Glenn that she's closer to deciding who she wants to be. Uh, Kaye suggests that this isn't the real her and perhaps it's just more the product of the current crisis. But Glenn points out that her behavior has generally been consistent over time and that maybe now is the time to be that person who murders people to avenge her friends. Um, if, you, if you've de decided who you want to be, Glenn said, accept all of it, the good, the bad, the ambiguous, vulnerabilities and strengths. The anger, that's part of it. The fear for people who care about you, that's a strength too. It doesn't feel very good while you're experiencing it, but it's a well you can tap. Yeah, that's so it's such an amazing little speech and it fits so well into what Taylor's struggling with right now. Like she's she's attempting to mold herself into the person she wants to be by kind of cherry picking attributes like I want this from this one. I want this from Skitter. I want this from Weaver. I want this from me. But it, that's just creating a persona. That's not really being who you are. Right. Because who you are has some negative there are, there are some vulnerabilities there there are some bad things as part of you and and so what does it mean to just fully accept who you are 
and and be that person and stop stop creating a personality and just being who you are yeah that is really interesting that and and that is that strikes me as being a much more adult perspective on how you kind of get a grip on yourself because it's easy to forget even at this point the taylor's what like 18 now yeah yeah so which you know but when i was 18 i was a complete idiot and and, uh certainly did not have the kind of the kind of um acceptance of myself that glenn is advocating for here so yeah would would, and i I agree with glenn i should say that I, i think that's kind of the only approach you can take when you're trying to get a handle on this kind of thing yeah i agree yeah glenn is wise he's a wise wise man Yes, I love I love Glenn. He's my favorite. So the next doorway leads to Miss Militia. She finds uh, Taylor finds her team and the heartbroken watching a movie on a projection screen. And the movie has a dog in it. And Rachel is super annoyed that nobody else notices <laughs> that the dog is played by different dog actors. <laughs> oh, Rachel. She's pretty awesome. Uh, she writes a letter to Miss Militia thanking her for having her back. And she then uses her bugs to send it to her before departing. So I copy pasted this in here. I don't think we have time to read it, but it's beautiful. Yeah, it's absolutely yeah. beautiful. She, yeah, she's basically just thanking her for for being there for her and yeah. and for, for for being the kind of hero that that's worth, worth emulating. Yeah, I love Miss Militia. This is I, the, this kindness she extends her is yeah. really great. Yeah. So now she heads back to Tattletale, aware that she hasn't really met with everybody, and primarily aware that she she hasn't checked in on whether her dad is really gone or not. She can't take the hit to morale of finding out that he isn't. Um, so she finds Lisa asleep, crying a little bit in her sleep. She puts a blanket over her and then hears the Seamer singing a lullaby. The Seamer was outside. The lullaby continued as she worked on expanding her arsenal. Stop, I whispered. She stopped. And then a little bit later, I'm sorry. The words crossed my mind, my voice not my words. The simmer turned, her hair flowing in the wind. Her hands were still held up as she worked her telekinesis on yet another weapon to add to her, to her arsenal. Her eyes met mine. I found my way back to the couch, sitting, sitting, sitting next to Tattletail. I didn't sleep at all that night. <laughs> so, Jesus Christ, Matt, I don't even know what to say here, other than that's all terrifying and terrible. Like, she's referencing back to, to Dinah's note, um and like throwing an illusion in her her head with her own voice and like it's just oh my god oh my god yeah and it doesn't get any better in the next interlude when we see kind of what she's doing no and once, we don't really see why she's doing it right and and once again her eyes met mine her eyes are meaningless they don't work they don't do anything it's all yeah. just about like fucking with you yeah it's the behavioral equivalent of like a musical sting at a scary moment. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, 28.x, the interlude closing up this chapter. And we cold open on another weird point of view. This floating perspective sees into the past and the future, centered around certain targets looking for fulcrum points. The creature thinks about how, even if somebody moves into the cover of another power that blocks its future sight, it can still predict what will happen when the target moves out of cover. Yeah, this whole... This part of the chapter, once again, feels like Wild Bo kind of flexing his writing muscles again, um, because the Seamurg is completely alien and thinks in a completely alien way. And therefore, the way the prose is written is represented in this fundamentally non-human, different kind of way. Um, we saw this with the dog chapter way back when, and now we're seeing it again here. This this uh, exercise, I guess, to to track the mind of a being that sees causality it's really cool right yeah and i like how it's kind of communicated through these metaphors like a throne a stone is thrown into darkness it can safely it can be safely assumed that it will continue traveling until it hits something yeah Yeah. and we also learned that when when it hibernates it, it gathers enough information to build up an intricate causal web allowing it to do the classic waves of chaos propagating out into the world that that she does when she's active she yeah. thinks about the current obstacle, the one that is immune to her powers, both future and past sight. She can only combat it by setting up promising situations. So are we supposed to assume that's Scion? I don't I don't actually know. I don't know if we get confirmation. I, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, it's basically the, the her her main challenge right now. Yeah. So. 
So she's communicating with the other inbringers through media that makes sense to them, making sure everyone is on the same page. She ins- ensures that they cooperate with the subjects that she refers to them. The Simurgh builds a long glass tube, three feet across by seven and a half feet long, into the gun she's building. She ensures that the people watching her will not remark on this. Then she begins to sing her lullaby. Yeah, so this is one of those, I'm going to speculate on this at the end, just spoilers for speculation section, but this is something like intentionally meant to remain a mystery, I think, Uh, because I read this like seven times and and (laughs) it took me a while to come up with my guess. Um, I think this is something that's obviously key to the Seamark's plan and kind of what she wants. But since we still have no idea about what her actual desires are, it's like intentionally left mysterious. And I think... You know, if if you're wanting to build a mystery into your story, this is kind of the exact correct structural way to do it, um, to to set something up and then reveal information slowly in a natural, believable type of way. Yeah. I like it a lot. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. It's it's very, very cool how it's integrated. So the Simurg hears Tattletail look out the windows at her, and the Simurg draws her body into a line using the play of shadows to evoke the image of a hanging body. No need to even use her song here. She already knows the target well enough. Yeah. I don't, did we know that her brother killed himself hanging? I, I don't I don't know if we did. In fact, yeah, I, I don't, I don't I think mean, we the, had that information. Yeah, this seems to confirm it, though. That's This is probably the most disturbing thing we've seen the Seamark do so, f- so far. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, ugh. And it's so right. kind of subtle that you almost miss it. I think I missed it the first time I read through. It was on my second read through that I saw, oh, she's, she's specifically making a hanging body image. Yeah. Um, it's, God, it's so disturbing. Right. I'm not even sure. Um, um, I, 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 like, are we supposed to think that Tattletail got that consciously or that it just kind of like zapped her and incepted her? And then when she fell asleep, she had nightmares about it. Uh, I mean, I think it, I think it got her. I think it got her. She likes, we see her like step away from the window and just like, like, I think it got her. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're probably right there. I I was, I was never really sure though. Um, yeah. So she prepares to deal, the, the Sumer prepares to deal with Taylor now readying an auditory hallucination, but decides to deal with the mysterious other subject first. She sets down certain objects, shackle, syringe, scalpel, lens, lens. Uh, the intended target here is, far far away and and we're, we're we get, the, get get this interjection of these italicized bits that go like it's too much hey are you okay what happened nosebleed can you hear me you, you need to tell the kid to t- change targets aim it somewhere else things were getting blurry indistinct change targets so this is the first of of many of these mysterious italicized bits which appear to be a dialogue between two or more parties which crops up each time we change perspectives yeah, and of course, the first time you don't even fully understand what's happening um, until you get to the end of the chapter. And then if you're like me, you immediately go back and read the entire chapter again with this newfound knowledge, and suddenly everything makes perfect sense. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't until like this project that I did the read-through, and I realized that the shackle, syringe, scalpel, lens, lens was targeted at the doctor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, 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 or at least, you know... Uh, the same work knows she's being watched basically. right right yeah because that yeah she's she's preparing the thing to fuck with taylor and then the other subject is the doctor yeah like, listening in yeah right yeah so now the view changes and it rests on a wide area a metropolis then a whole world shortly after a golden light appears and destroys everything the focus eventually settles on chevalier resting in bed ingenue finally makes her way to visit him <laughs> No, Chevalier intoned. And and then we have this fun, fairly lengthy interlude that focuses on Ingenue and gives us more insight into Chevalier. Ingenue is just as screwed up as any other cape with a compulsion to obsess over men, mold herself into their perfect mate, boost their power, and eventually apparently drive them crazy. Other heroes appear and hold her still after Chevalier demolishes a door with his cannon. Yeah, I love this power, Matt. I love this idea for a cape power. It's basically mm-hmm. that the the cool girl monologue from Gone Girl, like made into a superpower, yeah, um, I love that. In, including all the destruction on both sides that 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 idea leads to. It's such a fun idea. Yeah, it's fantastic. And yeah. the way Chevalier deals with it is, oh, it's so great. Right. Yeah. It, it, 
yeah, I'm not sure if he deals with it perfectly well though, because everybody else is, is is like you're being too soft on her. Just say no. Just get her out of here. Yeah, and, and like like they're they're aware that he's like softening. Yeah. Well, and it's um, it's interesting because like we saw, like we, we contrast this with the last chapter, right? Where where um, Glenn is holding up Chevalier as this this paragon of of heroism of truly representing what being heroic in this world is and now we see here that he's compromising a bit to deal with this this lady yeah 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 i'm not gonna quote this whole bit here but but she's she's basically she's making all these really clever appeals to him talking about like the duality of their powers and how they complement each other and how he must be such a romantic and 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 they would be so they would be so so perfect together and and she's like always saying the perfect thing in response to whatever he says um, and I think it's fun because overall you're very much in you, you as the reader are put in the position that Chevalier is because she she actually seems so contrite and so justified and she's she's a survivor. She's she never prostituted anyone who didn't agree to it and she knows she's screwed up. But can't she still be helpful? And, and you're, you're genuinely genuinely uncertain how much of a poison apple she really is. Right. Right. And it's not like. She's not even the one poisoning the apple. <laughs> like it's right. just the way it's just how her power works. Like she mm. needs it almost as much as she wants him to need it. It's tragic. And right. it's fascinating. Yeah, right. I love I love this is one of the perfect examples of a of a tragic power. Yeah, like yeah. you said. So they send her off with Narwhal <laughs> and Exalt mentions that they think Scion is forty percent of the way through Earth's. Yeah, so that's that's our basic countdown, right? That eventually we're going to just run out of time. Like he's, he's intentionally avoiding conflict with them to take out the other earths. And then he's yeah. eventually going to come to them. Yep. So elsewhere, Canary and Saint stand with defiant as teacher and his gang emerge from portals with dragon. And Canary is here because Canary loves dragon. Like at first I, I legitimately was like, why is Canary here? And then I remembered that, that she loves dragon. Yeah. That she, yeah. she feels like she owes dragon and wants to be there. Yeah, she's trying to support her. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh Dragon's body in turn was cobbled together from scrap metal. Truck parts, car parts, some rusted. Her head hung low. A dragon, but not a noble one. That's I'm happy she's back. Like I I legitimately did not think this was gonna happen. That we were gonna get her back, but it's also kinda sad. Yeah. Yeah, well she's she's so like damaged and downtrodden, yeah. it's really sad to see. Yeah. Teacher tells Defiant that he has revived her and placed one teensy restriction, that she won't attack or condone attacks on him. If Teacher dies or falls out of contact, then she'll lose the ability to harm anyone or anything. So after all that, she's still a slave to someone. Yeah, right. Maybe even even worse than before in, yeah. in some ways. So this is definitely the most characterization we see from Teacher as well. Right. Despite not knowing, that, or sorry, despite not looking like a supervillain, he certainly knows how to monologue. Um, which makes a tremendous amount of sense when you think about his power, because by its nature, he's constantly surrounded not only by yes men who are under his thrall, but by yes men who are smarter than him. So I wonder what kind of life leads to that kind of trigger event. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, you could you could see teacher being a pretty apt name, right? That he's a guy that is like teaching advanced classes or something and he's always constantly lifting other people to greatness and then being left behind and like you could see that being a, a trigger event in some sort i don't know yeah it's, it's fun i don't know i had fun thinking about that one so back in the ship dragon and defiant agree that they'll make saint and teacher pay for this dragon can't bring herself to believe that she'll ever be free of the restrictions though <sighs> yeah it's so tragic like defiant is just actively calling dragon his girlfriend now and i uh, every time like i i snicker every time not because i don't like it because it makes me happy yeah um but yeah this scene is both kind of touching and terrifying a little bit um because we know we know the dragon like built the original bird cage on orders like she had to and she never really liked it we saw specifically with canary that she didn't like putting people in there and now like teachers beating her down and she's angry and she says she wants a new bird cage a place to punish these bad men for what we've done maybe not exactly the same but but something and and that's like it's so human of her right like like it, it worries me but she's mad and she's angry and that's human so that she's not just like like uh portraying emotions she's she has them 
yeah, we, we were just talking about how she's like the best person and she's the one who consistently rises above all these base feelings. And now she's kind of been d- downtrodden to the degree that she's kind of just wants revenge, actually. Right, right. Yeah. So we go back with Chevalier and uh, he offers a toast to a room full of surviving wards to going out with a fight, <laughs> which which is such a dismal toast. Yeah. I like a lot of the details in this though. I like the idea that they've run out of stem glasses. So some people had paper cups. I like that they're giving drinks to minors now, like standard rules and decorum are gone. It's really, this is, this is it. This is the end and, and glassware and rules. It doesn't matter anymore. It's all about what we have. You know, it's paper cup or fancy wine glass. Doesn't matter at the end of the world. Yeah. Right. So we watch the wards, including some that we know and love, like Vista and Tecton, mingle with each other, some joking and laughing, some somber and reflective. Legend arrives, and Chevalier walks him uh, walks with him to the package, which has been mentioned a couple times. They discuss the burden of leading people to their deaths, and Chevalier offers him a role as his second in command. Yeah, serving as kind of a, a redemption for Legend in a way, right? Um, right. He was always the one least okay with what Cauldron was doing. Who's kind of either tricked or or manipulated into supporting it? Um, yeah. and he's getting. But he still, yeah, he he still, he still feels guilt about it, regardless. Yeah, though, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Legend accepts almost desperately. And as he leaves to retrieve Ingenue, we see what the package is: a severed simmer wing, Behemoth's leg, and uh, then Chevalier turns at the approach of footsteps, and it's classic Winye. But then the connection breaks. Don't kill, don't kill Chevalier, scary fairy lady, please, please. Um, this is like, we know we've we've seen our characters like make choice, make choices in desperation, right? That's the whole recruiting the Endbringers thing was making choices in desperation, and we're kind of seeing Chevalier do this too. He wants to take these Endbringer parts and and integrate them into his weapons, and he needs Anjanu. Because she enhances his power and he's going to take all his power to be able to do this. And he's desperate. So he's playing with fire and desperation just like everyone else was doing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh boy. Totally. Totally continuation of oh that theme. Boy. Yeah. So then we kind of get what's going on here. Yep. The doctor kind of snaps out of it. She takes a deep breath and we realize it's been her watching all this. Doormaker and 265, the remote viewer, perpetual companions plus scanner and screen teacher students it's these helping hands that allow her to productively use the clairvoyance power without being bedridden for a week screen allows her to control her focus and her spying and scanner allows her to read people we realize that she was reading the simurg that this whole chapter has in fact been from one point of view the doctors yeah this is a a great reveal matt this is perfect this is the, the way this is doled out to us. It all makes sense in retrospect, but you're kind of confused. You're confused throughout, but not enough where you lose track of what's going on in the story. You're just confused about the framing device. Yeah, right. And and many times you're like, this is unusual. We don't normally jump point of view in, in an interlude, and then right. we realize no, we're not. We're not really jumping point of view. We're <laughs> we're, we're spying on, spying on people's heads. So, yeah. Yeah. So the doctor requests a notepad. None is forthcoming. 265 points out the problem. Weld is here with his irregulars. They show her uh, Mantellum, the power nullifier that has allowed them to creep up on her and apparently to deal with Contessa. Wow. So there's there's quite a bit of dialogue here between Weld and his irregulars. I'm just going to cut out this bit where they're kind of like, hey, why are you still talking to her? Some of us came here for blood. There were There were rumbles of agreement. This isn't what we talked about, Weld said. If you wanted to go this route, you should have brought it up earlier. We did, the muscle-laden girl with the overbite said. We talked about making it clear just how badly she hurt us. Then you said a lot of fancy convincing stuff, and we agreed to shut up. I thought you agreed with me, Weld said. So it kind of goes on, but like this is just so sad that this has come about. Yeah, it's really devastating, and I think it builds off the Weld that we've gotten to know so well especially in last arc when he admitted he was a guy that was really just scared and like he felt like he was really leading these people and, and that they really looked up to and respected him. And maybe that was never true. Yeah. Right. Like the, he, yeah, I think, I think that's probably accurate there there or, or maybe it was true on one level, but on 
on a on a more motivating level they they do share this deep deep anger and, and hatred yeah for for the cauldron people where the most he could do was productively direct them until this moment happens where the object of their hatred reveals itself and now there's really nothing he can do yep yeah so at this point he says uh th- does everyone disagree with me you've all been plotting this mutiny no the girl with the tendril said but i won't be of any help to you if you let me go i'm pretty sure i'll strangle her i'm sorry weld um oh, so yeah so sad, yeah so so 10 of the irregulars stand between the doctor and the remaining 40 of them one of them takes out Doormaker. 265 disables that one by touching him. So now they've lost their ability to get portals created anywhere. That's great. Yeah. It's, they, they were, it's really they wonderful. Were, yeah. They weren't relying on that or anything. Nope. And now Weld, ever the hero, is forced to fight against his fellow deviants on behalf of the person who did this to him. Yeah. This is a, a, a great heroic moment for Weld, and I love him. However, what was he expecting to happen here? Like what? What was they're just gonna walk up to Cauldron and just talk? Like what, what, I mean, I don't, I don't like. It seems like his whole plan was short sighted, a little bit here. Yeah, I mean, maybe they thought that there would be other, other, other K sixty threes in captivity or yeah, something. Yeah, which we know that there are. Yeah, um, I think he, I think he genuinely just wanted, to, like, to confront her. And, and like, yeah, make because her that, apologize. Yeah. Cause, cause that's what he's, cause in, in the, this isn't even the first time they've met the, the previous times that they met in the meetings, he has, he has been angry and he's been like, you know, justify yourself to us. And, and, it, and he really, he really wants this answer. Like he needs this answer. He, 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 it's, it's driving him crazy that, that, this person has done this to them and she's so blase about it. Right. And, and I think that that would satisfy him, but even that is not forthcoming, unfortunately. Yeah. But I think this is a, a, we've, we're seeing cauldron like fall here kind of, um, to a certain extent. And you know, it, it makes, it makes sense when you like cauldron was always big picture and they forgot about the human element. They forgot about the human beings that they were destroying to accomplish their objective. And those human beings are are coming back to roost now. Like this, this is the consequences of your decisions coming back to haunt you. And this is something we've seen over and over and over again throughout the story. But now it's happening to the, the greatest example of this, um, bad things for the right reasons organization. And they, they didn't think, they didn't think about the human beings they were destroying. Yeah. Yeah. And here they are now. Yeah. And, and very poetically that wraps up arc 28 cockroaches. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's, that's that's awesome. That's it. That's it. So let's move on into those speculations that you were hinting at. All right. Um, so the first one I said, Brian was dead. And that's technically wrong, but I, I don't believe it. <laughs> so my new speculation is Brian is Brian is dead again. <laughs> but um, for now, I think we have to mark that wrong because the story says he's not. The story okay. is lying. Um, so then we have my old complicated Endbringer theories. Let's give me half credit on that. I mean, I said a whole bunch of crazy stuff. I think I said that the fourth Endbringer was actually what gave everyone powers when it died it like split into all the different pieces and that's what gave people powers that's way off but um oh well i mean just uh, this idea that they're based on the elements i think is basically base basically true in the sense that like they are constructed to be based on archetypes yeah 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 half credit yeah uh the last one is that i don't uh was the one that created the Endbringers, and that's confirmed. Sixty percent is good enough for me. So yeah, yay. we call that confirmed. Yeah. yeah. So my new ones are um, the first one is of course that Brian is actually still dead, which means that that Lisa. You know, I've been suspicious of Lisa lying to people, and everyone's always called me out about it. And now, I guess this is probably just my suspicion again ruling me. But I think she's lying. 
Um, okay. I think I think she knows what this would do to Taylor, and she's lying. So I th- I still think Brian's dead. Brian is still dead. This is like my fourth speculation. I've said Brian's dead, but <laughs> <laughs> um, and then my last one. I think that that glass tube that the Seamurg was growing was a test tube, and I think she's growing a new Endbringer in that 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 test tube. Um, she sings she sings a lullaby right after doing that. So I think she's creating something, and. With the creator of the Endbringers dead, I think she's taking it upon herself to uh, expand that legacy out. So she's making another Endbringer. That's my guess. All right. Awesome, as always. So let's let's wrap this up. That wraps up our coverage of Arc 28, Cockroaches. I hope everyone enjoyed our discussion and hearing Scott's reactions. And as always, we appreciate your feedback. And we're always trying to improve. So let us know if you have any advice, questions, or thoughts on this week's episode. Yeah, you can reach us via email at gotwormpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at gotwormpod. My personal Twitter is at scottdaily85 and Matt's is mafapinom. That's right. And if you're not already subscribed to We've Got Worm, we strongly recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else in the world you can listen to podcasts. And as always, you can find this, all the other podcasts we do, in all of our writing, essays, film, and TV criticism, and more at dailyplanetfilms.com. It's Thanksgiving this week in America, so many of our weekly podcasts are taking some time off. But you can still check our thoughts on Justice League over on the Daily Planet podcast feed that came out uh, yesterday. That's right. Yep. And if you like any of these shows and want to support them, we have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash Daily Planet Films. Consider donating a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford. Special thanks to new Planeteer John at the $5 level. Also, speaking of Patreon, make sure you stop by Wildlow's page and toss some money there because he's the guy that makes this whole thing possible. And if you can't afford a pledge right now, that's okay. You can still help us out by sharing this podcast with everyone you know. We do no marketing here. Maybe we should maybe we should do marketing, Matt. But we, mm. we do no marketing here. So all of our growth is done through word of mouth by dedicated listeners like you. So you can you can share us with people. Um, you can also stop by iTunes to rate and review us. Each and every review opens up new listeners to checking us out. We got a whole bunch of new reviews this past week, Matt. I'm only going to read one of them today. I'll get to the others in the future. But this week's comes from Clever Name Here. <laughs> who gives us five stars and says, I find myself looking forward to this podcast every week. Not only is the content they cover incredible, but you can feel the passion that both Matt and Scott have for this project. I highly recommend this podcast and I can't wait for the next few weeks as they finish this massive project. TLDR, listen to this podcast. You'll love it. Sir, you're as clever. Your name is as clever as your review. (laughs) Thank you so much for all the kind words. We we really do appreciate it. I'm glad that that passion comes through because I am very passionate about this. I know you are as well, Matt. And, um, I'm glad, I'm glad that people notice that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's important because, uh, it, it's really takes a lot of passion to, uh, to do something this big. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I can't believe it's almost over. I can't believe it. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So, all right, that's it for us this week. Uh, next week, we'll be covering the first half of Arc 29, Venom, which will uh, be chapter 29.1 through 29.5. We think, right? I'm not sure. We haven't. I have, yeah, I have not double checked the logicalness of that split, but I, you know what? I think it's probably fine. All right. It, it, um, if, if we decide to do it somewhere else, we will announce that via Twitter. Um, yeah. But, yeah. So what's going to happen in this one, Scott? Well, I mean, so arc 31 is technically considered the epilogue, right? So this is this is it. This is the penultimate arc. And I think once again we're going to use both meanings of venom here. I think both the 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 poison itself and the extreme anger definition um I think Taylor and company have just taken hold of the endbringers, but the factions keep splintering. Uh, Weld has just taken down Cauldron or assisted in taking down Cauldron. And as our heroes prefer, prepare for the, the final attack, that divided nature is going to make Taylor mad and she's going to strike out with Venom. And I think that malevolence that she's going to have is going to have some pretty dire consequences because as I have said, I have officially declared Worm a tragedy and therefore the ending is going to be tragic. All right, well, we'll find out next week and over the subsequent weeks on another exciting episode of We've Got Worm. Bye.
Oh my god, Matt. That was a really long episode. Yeah. We almost did it, Scott. We almost, we almost broke, three hours. broke three hours. We could yeah. probably dick around for six more minutes. We could. We could. I don't think you really want to, though. I don't. <laughs> I, I sense that you may not be serious about that. <laughs>